So I'm going to call the Finance Committee for uh, May 20, 2021 to order uh, at 1 p.m. And thank everybody for being here yet again, since we're now in this rare time of year where we have twice a week meetings. Um, and this meeting uh, is being held by remote participation uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18. Um, and I'm going to, um, as we always do, um, check with each member of the committee to confirm that uh, they're fully connected and can hear and uh, that we can hear them. And uh, then I will uh, proceed with uh, today's agenda, which is the budget review, focusing on uh, general government. Uh, so Bob Hegner. I'm here. And Kathy Shane. Here. And Guzberg. Present. Pat Angelus. Present. Bernie Kubiak. Present. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Here. And Jane Scheffler. Here. Okay. And uh, so um, we know what the uh, agenda is focusing on today. And uh, I want to uh, then ask Sean if uh, you have a recommendation on the order that we um, are going to look at the sections of the budget. Yeah, um, thank you, Andy. So the council slash town manager will go first. I'm just keeping an eye on, I know Paul is going to hop on any minute now. Um, and then the finance office and with the finance office, we're going to cover um, debt assessments and OPEB as well. And then we're gonna do human resources and employee benefits, information technology, um, town clerk elections and registrations, and then facilities management. Um, and people, I've gave them sort of rough times when to, to join on. So they'll, you'll see people join on throughout the meeting. Um, so the first one would be the town council and town manager. However, the star of the show is not here for that. So we can either wait a couple minutes or we can, um, or we can skip and go to finance, or we could do IT since I see Sean Hannon is here. Uh, when the... Sean, be... Sean, are you there? Otherwise, the yes. only other thing you can do is split up uh, finance into sections. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe since Sean's here, um, if you're okay with maybe doing IT first and that way he could get out of here. Absolutely. No objection, no objection from me. <laughs> Are there any questions that uh, you had received in advance, Sean, on that? Not for IT. I do have some questions that I'll bring up when different departments come up um, that Jane sent in, but um, I don't see anything for IT. So, Sean, do you just want to give a um, sort of a brief overview of the IT department? Yeah, That'd be great. Um, so very busy year um, in terms of personnel from last time we met. I don't think there have been any changes. We had um, Serge Fedorowski who started uh, about a year and a half ago. So he would have been, um, he would have been here for the last time we went through the, the budget process. Um, so no real changes in terms of personnel. Um, we had a, busy, different year, um, last year. Uh, I don't know how much um, need to get into that, but deploying a lot of laptops, um, webcams, getting everybody set up to work remotely, meet remotely, um, um, transitioning back to working in person. Um, out of that, uh, upgrading Wi-Fi in some some town buildings. We started that, and we're we're finishing that off. Um, got a um, a fairly large phone project going on now. Um, we're in the process of replacing our our existing phone system that's 
been upgraded, but the the core of it's about 15 years old. So it's um, time to replace that. So we're in, in process of that. Um, we've got the fiber optic cable being installed to replace the iNet. Um, that's well, well on its way. It's taking longer than we were told longer than we expected, but it's, it's moving along, along with that. We've got some, some network changes that, uh, once that's operational, we need to make some network changes. Um, let's look at through our, uh, budget book. Um, we're continuing the cybersecurity awareness training um, that uh, we've rolled out to all employees, including town councilors. Um, this year, we've also included the, through the state grant, we've included school and school department employees who use our financial system. Um, Sean's, Sean's idea and it uh, made sense. We get, were able to do it uh, essentially for free under the grant. Um, that's major projects in terms of our budget. Um, nothing, nothing huge in terms of changes, uh, salary increases. And, um, you see in the budget, the biggest, the biggest increase is continuing the, um, software maintenance that most, most of the packages we use go up on an average of 5% a year, um, We've also, many of the uh, products we use, use have switched to uh, more of a subscription subscription model. Um, as I imagine most of you have seen personally in that, uh, that their maintenance costs that we pay annually um, that, are, that are greater. Um, I think that's uh, pretty much it. I don't know. Yeah, I can maybe I'll... I'll add real quick, um, as you can all imagine, Sean and his team have been, you know, one of, if not the sort of most integral members of town hall during all this in terms of, you know, not only converting public meetings, um, you know, to remote, but also getting everybody the technology, the technology they need, training them how to use the technology, getting it, you know, not, you know, getting it set up in the office is one thing, but to get it set up in somebody's home is a, is a probably a bigger challenge that Sean can tell you about, um, <laughs> And so they've been great at really getting everybody what they need um, throughout town to so that we can continue to work and continue to be productive. And I haven't, you know, there really were not huge productivity losses um, through the pandemic. And a lot of that is thanks to the work Sean did. And he's got the same name as me. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. And spell it correctly. So um, let me see if anybody else has questions. I was going to ask a few along the lines of what was just said, but uh, let me get to the, uh, have to get my just list up so I can see that the three people who have hands raised right now. So I'm going to start with uh, recognizing people whose hands are up and Dorothy Pam. I have just recently completed the security training at uh, Holyoke Community College. And I have a, I printed out the certificate, but I truthfully would be unable, I don't know how to go back and even find it to send you it uh, by electronically. Can I mail you my certificate so I don't have to take the course again? Yeah, I'd, I would imagine it's the same. Um, it's probably the exact same training because the state is, has funded it. So, um, if, if you've done it, if you've done it, I'll, I'll take your word for it. There's, uh, I'll, and I'll see if we can check that off in the, uh, in the system. I mean, to be, to be honest, I learned only two things. Don't plug a uh, little device that you find into your computer and don't pay your medical bills with a credit card. Um, that was it, but it took hours and hours. Yeah. I guess the other thing I would add is don't don't hesitate to ask us if some if something looks suspicious. Uh, right. We're we're happy to uh, happy to help. Right. That was the answer to most questions. <laughs> ask your team. Right. <laughs> I got that. Kathy. Uh, yeah. Um. I'll start with you said INET is taking longer than expected. Um. Are you budgeted in a way that you're fine dollar wise on it? 
um, does that mean, so I'm basically, will, will it come in at or under budget? It's just taking longer. Yeah, as far as I know right now, the, the delays are not, um, they're, they're not adding costs to the project where they do add costs as we do um, our use of the INET expired through Comcast. So we are paying monthly for that. Um, and I believe that's being paid for by CARES money, but Sean, Sean could answer that. Yeah, so we um, we saw authorization from the state to to use CARES money for that because the original delay was in part caused by COVID. Um, and, and some of the factories that um, produce the fiber and they were supposed to get started sooner than they did. Um, so we've been able to charge that because it was an unbudgeted cost. We thought we were gonna have the fiber in much sooner. Um, so, so far that there has been additional costs but it's been covered through CARES. Okay, so I have, I just have a, another one related to INET and broadband. I saw on page uh, eight of this very, long report that the town is anticipating getting $10 million in uh, American Recovery Act dollars. And one of the uses is broadband um, infrastructure. So my question was, can the IT department tap into that at all? Does that, does it potentially enable us to go even further than you were already planning anything with um, our uh, affordable housing, large apartment complexes or senior centers where we could bring it. So, so I don't know how much you would get involved if that money is available. Would you get involved in making some decisions about that use of broadband? Yeah, so- oh, um, no, Go, go yeah, ahead, why don't, you, why don't you start? Yeah. So what I, what I can tell you about the fiber that's going up there, most for the most part, it's up there and in the ground is installed for municipal use only under um, agreements that we have with the utility um, companies. So we we have the right to go on the poles and in the conduits um, because we're using the, the fiber for municipal use. We can, if, if the town chose to, the town could license the pole attachments, basically license to have the fiber up there um, and use it for that purpose in the future. There's a cost to that, and then there obviously be a cost to um, expanding it and connecting non-municipal buildings. So the the short answer is yes, absolutely. What what we're putting up there has the capacity and could be used for something else. Um, it's just there's uh, we would need to license it, and then we would also need to something something would be need, would need to be put into place um, to provide service on it and support it and everything else, which is uh, an undertaking. So does that mean, Sean, John, you let, jump let, 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 Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to add. Let Sean so, finish. Yeah, that's a, uh, oh, Sean Hannon or the Sean? No, I, Sean? I'm, yeah. Okay. I'm also, um, sorry, Sean. Yes, okay, yeah, no. um, so the, uh, that's an eligible use we're looking at closely. We, you know, we're, there's more, details out, but there's still not sort of all the details out. What I've read so far about that particular eligible use, it's a, you can do it where um, uh, broadband or high-speed internet doesn't exist. You can use the ARPA funds to, to put it in, which I'm not sure if that were, that would apply in Amherst, because I think, you know, it's still, it exists there, even if it's not municipal um, internet, it would, you know, there, there's options for other forms of it. Um, so it's unclear whether we could use it for that because, um, it already exists in, a, in one form or fashion. Um, it's, I think that that eligible use was more about building it out in sort of more rural areas where there is no um, fiber at all. Um, but not to say that, that that's a definite. So we're gonna we're gonna look at that more and see if there's any possibilities there. So let's see if Paul has anything to say on this, and then turn it go back to Kathy. So Kathy, don't I'm not losing you. Thank you. Paul, so did you have something you wanted to add? I did. Um, so along these lines, if you set, you need to set up a, a, a municipal utility to implement a program like this. You can't just offer it. You need to have a utility and have a revenue stream and do. And it has to. It's a legal process. It takes time. It takes two votes of the town council, and I, I think even a, a vote of the people to set up a utility to do this. So uh, Northampton is looking at this now. It's probably something that the town might be interested in looking at. 
but um, it's not just something that we can just run a line down to folks. It's, it's a pretty elaborate process. I think to get a municipal power light company or something like that, Kathy. Okay, that, I think that answers what was going to be my follow up question. So, um, that the the uh, ARPA money, is, the recovery money, might not even be able to be tapped into, but it certainly wouldn't do if what Sean said we have to do an ongoing cost if we want to use it. So it wouldn't pay for the operating costs very long. So I, I, I got the answer I was looking for. Thank yeah. you. And again, it's not definite that it can't. Um, it's just what, what I've read so far. Um, so yeah. Anything else, Kathy? No, mm -hmm. I'm done. I do, I do want to say that I think you guys have been fabulous. I, with, <laughs> with, with both all the Zoom meetings we're doing, but then you regularly, when I say, I can't find the the recording, you go, oh, someone wants to see it. You get it to us right away. You know, if we're looking at it because we're doing minutes or someone is asked to see it and you, your team has just been amazing. So thank you. Thank you. I'm lucky to uh, have, have the team that I do. Uh, makes my life easy. Lou? Um, yes, let me also add my thanks to everything you've done this year particularly at the point in time where all of a sudden during the security test, I got set up as one of the scam emails. And so all of a sudden I was getting these emails from people. Did you really want me to send you a credit card number? Uh, whatever. So thanks for that, Sean. Um, <laughs> I did. I talked to Sean and he said, oh yeah, we didn't realize when we set this up that you could be one of the random <laughs> people. Well, I was. So much more importantly, for all the amazing other stuff you've done this year. Um, I do have a question and it pertains to uh, software as it is adopted or adapted by other departments and the extent to which IT gets involved in that. So for example, um, you know, we're putting in a new uh, piece of software we, where we can collect fees for something. Do you get involved in the actual selection of the software? Are you basically depending on the expertise of the department uh, because of their professional affiliations to know kind of what's out there? Um, and how does that work? Yeah, so we, we pretty much always get involved. Usually it's, it's kind of through the budget process and the requests come through there um, first, but that we, we get involved there and depending on depending on the department and what they kind of some departments already have something in mind um we work with the department to evaluate the software um make sure it's a good fit um like warner works works a lot on that and make sure that if it's um new ambulance billing software make sure that it works with the collectors and you know the the permitting software is a good example example just because that touches so many different departments and make sure it's just because it's perfect for inspections um make sure it's still a good fit for dpw and fire and everybody else and collectors who who all use this so yeah it gets involved in in that um working with the department to find um software that's appropriate and and sustainable in terms of of cost Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'll ask one question and I see Bob Hagner's hand is up too. So I'll get to Bob in a second. I uh, think that we've spoiled ourselves and spoiled our community a lot through having all of our meetings on Zoom because our meetings have actually been more accessible to the public and as Kathy pointed out, available to us to use for other purposes. And uh, we're now going to be in, a, uh, in the next fiscal year or even the end of this fiscal year starting to transition back to in-person meetings. Uh, are we still at the point where uh, the town room is the only room that can be used for 
recording meetings or is there, or do we have have we been able to follow through with the plans to expand that capacity yeah and, and so paul may want to add to this but what i can say is the town room currently is the only room that we can support recording the meetings but more importantly it's the only room that we we really have equipped to support um what we're we're kind of calling hybrid meetings if they do happen, um, kind of meetings where um, some participants are remote um, as well as in person, as well as the, the public participating remotely and in person. So the town room is currently the only room that's equipped to do that. Um, but with the changes to the changes coming June 15th, um, we certainly can look into what it would cost to equip other rooms to, to start recording and or support hybrid meetings. Yeah, Paul. So, so June 15th is the, the reason we're able to meet like we do here through Zoom is because the governor has a state of emergency declared and there are executive orders that permit this way of uh, of meeting. That expires on June 15th unless they extend it or something like that which means we go back to our old way of doing things, which means you meet in person um, in the, which are the designated room and certain meetings are recorded and others are not. Um, and so I think that that is something we're prepared for. Um, I don't know if the public and the committees are prepared for. Um, and so we have looked at this hybrid and Sean and his team have looked done some pretty extensive work on what a hybrid meeting looks like. And it basically is a Zoom meeting with people sitting in the same room together with your laptops in front of you. Um, the council is the only committee that has got town issued laptops. So it's not really um, transferable to other committees. Um, and it takes some uh, technical support to run those meetings, which would we can we are obviously obviously going to devote to the council and its committees, but would not don't have the capacity to offer that to every committee out there because there are dozens of meetings a week. Um, so uh, it's so right now it's a um, unless unless we have and and also in order for someone to participate remotely, there we have a remote participation process where you have to submit in advance that you want to participate remotely and you can participate I think in five per year or four in a row something like that there's certain rules so unless the state changes that um, you know and we're hoping they change it at least and they keep it as we are now at least until Labor Day we will be back in person under the normal circumstances as we have in the past come at least by Labor Day but right now we're prepared for June 15th Um, thank you, Bob. Yeah, I just had a couple of questions. Um, the first, you mentioned that you were uh, in the process of upgrading the phone system. And I'm wondering kind of what we're targeting for that because the company I work for, eventually they started out with copper lines and then they went to IP phones and then they went basically threw out the phones altogether and just went through Zoom or other uh, applications on our laptops. And so, um, that's one question, uh, you know, is the town set up to do that? The second question I have is on the town computers, um, are there uh, strict uh, security protocols? Again, the company I used to work for, at, for a long time, I had admin rights on my own computer and eventually they took that away from everybody. So I couldn't even download a printer driver. I had to go through the IT department to do that. And it stopped a lot of problems. So just if, if you could, elaborate on those. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in the phone system, uh, what we are going to uh, or say what we're going from, we currently have a Cisco VoIP system. So it is, um, it is network based, but we're relying on kind of, I don't want to say old fashioned, but these, these um, PRIs through Verizon that are, are, you know, 30 plus year old technology, essentially they're T1s. Um, that we're having a lot of quality call quality problems with. So we're, we're moving off that. We're moving off the Cisco system. We're moving to a different VoIP system, uh, voice over IP network system. Um, but it is, um, it's primarily um, handset based. So for our users and for supporting our users, it's primarily, you know, what you would consider a, a conventional office phone. 
but it does support running a client either on a mobile device or on a laptop. In fact, um, health department, we've been working a lot with them just with the changes with, with um, hotlines and everything that they've wanted set up for COVID and people coming and going and people working from home. They've, most of the users in the health department um, have, have gone to just basically to the PC based client. So they just, they use a laptop and the uh, um, headphones and they, they're pretty, they're pretty happy with it. Um, and it works well for them. We, for, for, for the bulk of our users in terms of making the transition as easy as possible, we're going with, with conventional handsets, but it, it gives us a lot of flexibility going forward in, in disasters, working, people working remotely, um, and that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of security of our computers, we, we've changed it over the years, but we're trying to strike a balance between restricting what people can do and, and making, making sure they can still use the computers. So we do, we do lock things down. Um, some there, you know, they, they do require admin credentials and I think the, uh, the counselors have probably experienced this trying to install stuff on their laptops um, previously. So there, there are by default, no, no users get um, admin, admin credentials. Um, the other thing that I think is, has really helped us um, between user education um, and um, we use Office 365 for our email and that does a, does a pretty good job of, of stripping out malicious links, um, blocking a lot of stuff. It's not, it's not perfect by any means, um, but it does a pretty good job of, of helping filter out some, some of the garbage so it doesn't get through. Yeah, thanks. It, it, it just personally, it was very irritating not to be able to install a driver, but um, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it really did help with uh, system security. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think I think it's helped us. Thanks. Thank you. Kathy, did you have anything else? Uh, yeah, I was just I was just going to say that um, your team. It's actually it, it, in a previous place I worked. They did too, Bob. When you get totally frustrated, they from their headquarters log on to your computer and do what you want. So it's labor intensive for Sean and his team, but they get me that driver that. You know, I can't, I can't install my printer without, um, you know, so that's been, so I didn't have to, at first I thought I had to bring the machine, you know, the laptop down. And so it was a, a quick ish fix, but it was labor intensive. <laughs> right. I and mean, that's why we have such problems with windows systems is that anyone with admin rights can get into your computer. So. Yeah. Okay. Anything else in our questions? Uh... Because I think I uh, appreciate all of the great work you're doing. And it seems that the, uh, we know it, you can clear about the challenges ahead and uh, understand that the uh, software costs uh, is because that big behemoth the industry is interested in their profits and they're getting them from us. <laughs> Absolutely. Anything else from the committee? Okay, so Mr. Hammond, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your support. So we want to go back and uh, go to the council and town manager office, Sean. Yeah, so um, Paul, you're up next. Um, so there were a few questions, but I'll let Paul do sort of an overview of the council and the manager's budget, um, department budget, and then I'll um, go to the questions. So thank you. So um, our budget is pretty straightforward. Um, we have the uh, we have twenty five percent of the clerk of the council. Seventy five percent of the of that position is under the um, under the council. Um, our staffing is this is the same. We have an administrative assistant at fifty percent of the time, um, and the communications manager is moved into the to the budget at seventy five percent of the time, um, with one foot still in IT. Uh, and then the assistant to the town manager as well. The, um, the, the questions that folks had were about 
um, whether there's been a lot of turnover or not. Uh, are we doing questions now, Sean? Yeah, you can you can go right into questions okay. if you want to okay. go through them. Yeah, so um, there there has been some turnover. Uh, half of the turnover seems to be about, especially at the department head level, is due to retirements. We have um, the the um, the health director was retirement. Uh, the the human resources director and the town clerk both moved on to other opportunities. Uh, the finance director was filled after a long vacancy, which I think we're all happy with. Um, it was worth the wait. Um, and so, you know, it is something we're paying attention to in terms of what does that mean when there is turnover? Does that reflect anything in our organization? Um, it's something the new HR director and I have talked about in terms of doing a um, third party assessment of our operations to see if there's anything that any indicators there um, in terms of turnover. And we are seeing that there's a fair amount of turnover throughout the organization. Um, the economy is such that people are taking advantage, have making different life choices, and also are um, have additional opportunities out there. And we're noticing sometimes our pay structure isn't as um, competitive uh, in certain areas, especially areas that require licenses, um, as we are in other places. Um, in terms of the uh, the question was about the eighty thousand dollars. So last year we put in eighty thousand uh, dollars to address systemic racism because that was early in the process, and we wanted to allocate funds uh, to have available for that. The funds twelve thousand dollars, I think it was roughly that. Uh, we put, uh, was given as stipends to the members of the community safety working group. Each was given a a thousand dollar stipend because we recognize for this group in particular. Uh, we were ex asking them to do a lot of intense personal sometimes work uh, that was, and they have really delivered on that work. So it's a small stipend, but um, it's just to, in recognition of the time of kind of commitment and the intensity of the work over a short period of time that we were asking them to do. Uh, the bulk of the funds um, went to a consultant who produced a uh, report that the council has received uh, called Seven Gen Movement Collective. And that's a local company that has produced this, the report on uh, on the police department and, and community safety in general. Um, we have about twelve thousand dollars left. Um, half of that funds is being um, offered for training through our core equity team, and the other half I've had discussions with the reparations group, um, understanding there's some restrictions in terms of procurement, but seeking. Um, I've asked them if there are things that we can support their efforts on along these lines, and they're looking at into that right now. And so it's open to any questions. Okay. Kathy? You need it. I sure am. Staying on the 80,000, I see it's in the coming year budget also, and it looks like you're, I had to look at two different places, but you're augmenting it with, uh, the plan is to re augment it with another 30,000 from ARPA. And is that, is the intention that, so I'm at 80 and 30 and getting 110, is that your plan, is that going to be a permanent part? Do you see it an ongoing part of the budget? And if the answer is yes, for, Toward what purpose, what function, what, what are you thinking about? So uh, we have a lot of work to do in this area and we needed to start carving out funding to address many of the things that we have to do in terms of as we start to roll out um, system or organization wide um, training and for all of our staff, um, it's gonna take time, it's gonna take multiple years. And so we want to be able to have funds available to that. and. Um, as you know, we're, we're creating the uh, DEI coordinator role and there are gonna be ex expenses that go along with that because part of that role is to both work with our existing staff, talk about uh, recruitment and retention. And both of those things are important functions for us because um, we can put a lot of effort into recruitment and if we're not able to hold on to folks because of a, not a, our work environment, we need to understand what that is. Uh, so there is gonna be some recruitment expenses that we're trying to be more proactive on and not just sort of putting ads in the paper, but 
um, reaching out to people individually. And I think we have the right person who's going to be helping us with that. Um, so yes, it is, it is uh, not designated for specific things right now, other than some of it, I know our core equity team, I really want to support our, in our, our homegrown core equity team that's really working on these, these issues and, um, and want to give them the resources they need to carry that out. And they're in the, like their proposal is for next year is in the 30 to $40,000 range. So, so I think what I heard you say, then you're not thinking that you would actually hire a specific person. You're going to be using it in a similar flexible way that you've been using this year's money for, for multiple, it can be drawn in in multiple ways. Would that be a fair way of? Yeah, we want to be responsive to needs yeah. as they come up and opportunities. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. I want to stay, uh, you said that um, the 80, part of the 80,000 this year would be uh, for the DEI coordinator. Is that accurate? No. For, well, for the, when you say that this year, you mean 30,000? Are you talking about FY22? Yeah, sorry. 22? Yes. So it would be to support, it's not to fund the DEI coordinator position, but to provide support for the work that they're doing. Gotcha. Here's my question then. And it's a question for the original 80,000 in FY21. I would like to see as a council member and as a member of finance, a detailed reporting about how that money is spent, has been spent or projection for this next year. And I would really like to have that. The other thing is where this was, when I heard that you were gonna do something, you know, funding for the DEI, are there other places in the budget where there's money tech tucked away in a lump uh, that, that you, you are actually as going towards the DEI or the multicultural center or any of those other issues and our knowing those things would be very helpful. So. Yeah, um, I, I, you tuned out a little bit there for a second, but I, I, what I heard is that you want to report on this, on the current spending for the existing FY21 80,000. And I can update that for you. Um, I think I sent one back uh, maybe a month ago, but I can update that with the more recent information, which I'm happy to do. Um, in terms of the allocation for the FY22 funds, I can put that out, lay that in a little more detail from what we know at this moment in time. Yeah, right. Yeah. And the, well, the other part of the question was, it sounds like you've you have earmarked some money to help support the DEI. So th to me, that sort of tucked into this figure. So are there other places in the budget where you've tucked money away to address some of the community safety working groups, concerns and issues in the FY22 budget in the same way where it may be part of a lump sum, but you're thinking about so, I mean, Sean can weigh in on the ARPA money. So that's one of the paths that we're- um... The 30,000? Yeah, do you want me to add to that, Paul? Yeah, please. Um, so, the, so the DEI coordinator position, again, there is a, a existing part-time position, 50, it's not a part-time person, but it's a split position, 50% right. um, position that's in the general fund budget. We are going to combine $30,000 or proposing to combine that position with $30,000 of the ARPA money to create a full-time DEI coordinator position who would then help you know, direct how the $80,000 or guide some of the uh, activities that the $80,000 would go towards. So that's separate from the 80. Yes. Um, and then you know, the, the human resources budget in general, you'll be talking with the, um, with the human resources director in a little bit. You know, I'm sure there are also uh, some of her funds that will also support some of these initiatives, and we can um, we can ask those questions in a little yeah. bit when she comes up. Yeah, thank you, Sean and Paul. It seems to me that having ac more access to this information would be helpful to address some of the concerns that we're hearing from the community across the community. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, and this is a more um, possibly uncomfortable question. Um, we lost our town clerk to a better position. We lost our human rights director to a better position. But it's interesting to me that uh, one of them was a black woman and one of them was a Latina woman. 
and I, 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 I am concerned for some of the things that I've heard through the grapevine about some interactions that were not comfortable for those for one one of the women in particular. So I guess I'm trying to figure out how much is it possible that our our lack of um, understanding or I don't even know how you say it have we driven some people of color out of this community and I, I am concerned I, I know this is a tender topic but I am really concerned about it um, yeah no I totally so agree Pat yeah I agree and I, I mean we put a lot of effort into recruiting strong people into these pivotal these important positions and then that's why I talked about retention as an important function and also external um, look at how, and is it something I am doing? Is this something our organization is doing? What is, why, why, or is it just happens? Is it just that people hit two opportunities and they chose? But it's because you, what you just identified is significant. I feel we need to investigate that and look into it. Thank you. And, and it's painful and uncomfortable for all of us. But, but, yeah, I but think it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's clear that's, that's not something we want to have happen. And, um, and it could be that people made life choices um, or for career. And I'm, that's what I'm hoping. That's but, but, but we need to understand that. And yeah. that's one of the things we had talked about. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Mm -hmm. right. um, I am still not sure what our way forward is in terms of the issues we've just been discussing. Um, for example, spending a lot of money on training uh, is what people are doing. I personally don't think it has much efficacy. Um, I do think a clear statement, that an institutional statement that certain kinds of behavior will not be tolerated um, and real response because I, it's not so much the institution, it's the people in the institution that cause the, the bad situations that drive away people that you have spent a lot of time and money hiring. Um, but I also wanna know is where is, I mean, we were asked the finance committee to come up with a clear revenue stream for the reparations committee. And I, I want to just say, I think we cannot go on as usual. Uh, the aim has been to be organized, intelligent, efficient, planning, doing it right. And that, you know, that's been really going great. All right. But sometimes the system has to respond out of its comfort level. And we've had four different actions. I think it's four. I mean, life is very confusing right now. Going on where people have organized, protested and said, wait, please listen to me. Um, we're, we're supposed to have a role in this government. And if all of them are not fulfilled, if all of them are beaten back, then the institution, you can say, oh, we're strong. We withstood it. We did great. But then what happens is the public says, forget it. I have no interest in it. I'm not showing up. I'm not gonna to listen to meetings. I'm not gonna do anything. They can do whatever they want, okay? I don't care. And you know, you can run it, a town runs easier that way, but it's not very democratic. And I, I just think we have to, so where are we gonna respond, all right? Um, it's not gonna be on the moratorium, the way things look. Um, it's, uh, I don't believe that voter veto is going to win. I think we're gonna pursue with the library. We will go forward on the four capital projects. But I do think that, um, and I think Paul is working with the community safety working group and at some point we will have a rebalanced, I hope police social service budget response team. I, I believe we will get that in time. So that leaves reparations. And I just feel that we're at the time right now when that's something we can't just say, well, we've done a budget, we've done it great. We've done it all, all our stuff. That'll mess up our planning. I think we have to mess up our planning. I think we have to come up with something. And you know, I don't have the suggestions on that. You are the experts. But so, I'm just saying, I think we have to do yeah. it. Yeah. So, so I think three things there, uh, Dorothy. First off, I, I disagree with you on the training. I think training matters. I, I felt the training that I went through with the council for that those three weekend days was really pivotal for me. Um, I think that kind of uh, work has to be done at the employee level uh, because it's it's about learning and um, 
creating a space to have dialogue with each other. So I think that's really important. And that's what I really want to, and I think our core equity team is, is doing that. And we're sort of utilizing homegrown talent to help us move in that direction. We just had one last week and the employees were emailing back saying what a terrific experience it was. So um, we're moving forward. I think that is important for us as an organization and as a community. Um, in terms of the, um, how are we responding? You know, I've, I've really appreciated the Community Safety Working Group report. If you have not read it, I encourage you to read it. I think it's really a good document. Um, you know, we have been working um, a couple, we've met a couple times this week and re to review that document and start to put together some numbers to help on the implementation. What's it look like to get this plan into action? Um, and we are, you know, we'll hopefully have something for you next, a week from today to be able to say, have a timeline and dollars associated with it. So it starts to look like, so it, people can see there's action. If assuming the council wants to create this department, that's sort of an important thing. If it's a creating a new department, it actually requires a vote of the town council under the town charter. Um, in terms of reparations, it's a, that you just had that handed to you on Monday and that's a, it's, it's a referral to the finance committee. We've, you know, Sean and Sonia and I have had some thoughts along those lines, but I mean, that's a pretty big discussion to have and understand what's the purpose and how are you going to allocate it? So I think that's a, a significant conversation for the council to have uh, and, and the public too, to weigh in as well. If I could respond just briefly, but we've seen reparations coming for two years. Remember you all, you had town staff delivered us that book at the very beginning of our tenure. Um, I'm glad to hear that the core equity training is good. Perhaps we should have some. That's not what we got. Bernie? Yeah, just maybe I missed it, but um, I've been looking for a copy of the final report from the community um, mm -hmm. uh, services group. I've been, I've read through what's on their website, their page in the website. So that's still in draft form. Um, it's an interesting document. Uh, the community response stuff is something I very, very much favor for a variety of reasons. Um, but that um, report falls short in a number of ways, which we may hear about in the future and some of that may be corrected. So I'd really appreciate getting a copy of that um, final document. And they also made reference to yet another document that's gonna be available on June 30th. So I'm not sure uh, what we're quite missing or I'm quite missing. I'll send it to you and um, I'm just seeing if it's on their website yet or not, but I know Jennifer is going to post that. We, we got it Monday night. So I was also thinking that Sean might want to go ahead and post it in the 27th meeting. So it's there as well as send it to us, but we know that's something we're going to be talking off of. So just get it in the right place. It's not always easy when we have the kind of meeting we had Monday night. It's not always easy to find the document you're looking for. Um, there were a lot. Okay. Yeah, and, and just the resident members don't always get any of this information, so it would be helpful for us to get whatever is sent to the council. Yeah, that, that is I, I, I try to do my best uh, that I can with that. Uh, because the uh, SharePoint program is uh, a limited access database to try and pull out the stuff that doesn't end up in the public uh, pack and make sure that it gets to you or at least that you're aware of it if it's in, related to the committee work. But um, I think that this last week has been uh, sort of over the top is moving in a very fast pace on several different topics. And Dorothy brought up the subject that uh, we were asked as a finance committee to, do, to report on something, think about something and report back and uh, having to do with reparations and identifying potential revenue streams. And we do need to get that um, into an agenda. And Sean and I have been talking about that so that it gets placed into an agenda and it becomes publicly available information that we're talking about it for the reasons that I open meeting law. Kathy, your hand is up. I didn't know if it was up. No, it is. I, is it, 
I'm going to switch and ask just a, a pretty simple question that's not related to this. So I just want to make sure no one else has their hand up to stay on this topic. No okay. one else has their hand up now. Okay, so my memory of last year um, is that I could see somewhere what we have budgeted for legal expenses. So I'm just wondering, is that under general government? Is that can I see that somewhere? And it's just, it's purely a question, um, not that I want to know what it is, but I just, can I find it, was my question. Is that to Sonia or, or Sean? That is a good question. I can't remember if it's broken out separately. It used to be, it used to be a separate section of the budget book, but we combined it with general services along with the audit and all the other outside contract type things we did. So it's it's in that line item. And it's separate on it. You can see it. I separated out still in the quarterly report. So okay. And what we could do, Kathy, is maybe add it to a few the next budget document. I'll make a note that maybe we break that out somehow because I know that's a, a question that's asked frequently um, by different people. So we could list it. Okay. I, I think that was it when I'm on general. I just was kind of trying to figure out where it was. Um, and my others, once we go to general, I have some questions when we get to benefits and some of the other pieces that we're working through. Andy, there were two other questions. You mind if I just read them off real quick? Sure. I, think, I think they're they're simple ones. Um, the first one, these are both town council related. Related. Um, mm -hmm. How are stipends for the council set? And I believe that's all, that's charter, right? Did you yeah, I can address that. So um, section 10.7 R of the charter sets the initial stipends for the council and the, and the school committee. So that was set by charter and there's a process for changing that. Um, and it's section 2.4, uh, which has a process if they if the council wants to change it, there's a process that and it's it's it, you can't just change it automatically. It takes a little bit. It takes some term time to do it. And then the next question similar to that was um, the but we added funds to the council's section for school committee stipends. And um, the question was sort of like how we came to the number because it's only for four stipends and not for five. Um, and that's because one of the members right now isn't eligible for the stipend. Um, so there's only four budgeted, but the, it's correct to point out that we would have to increase that in the future. So the, the fifth member is, a, is an employee of the school district and you can't take two salaries. You have to choose which one you want to take. <laughs> and I think that's it for, there's a couple other questions that I, I was going to raise at different points throughout the meeting today that aren't related specifically to this section. <laughs> Anything else then on uh, town manager, town council? Seeing none, uh, Sean got us forward. All right. Um, so the next section is finance. Um, and so I'm going to do a very brief overview of the sort of the whole group. And we have Sonia Aldrich, our comptroller, and Jennifer LaFountain, our collector, Sherry Boucher, our treasurer, and Elizabeth Duff Duffy, our assessor, who are here to answer any questions you might have on these sections. Um, but I'm gonna do a very brief overview of all of them just in the sake of time, so move us forward. So the, um, the finance office uh, globally is responsible for the overall financial health of the town. Um, and FY21, our major projects, we're working on the budget document, navigating all of the COVID grants, um, planning around the four building projects, and making some progress on reviewing our financial policies and our OPEB funding plan. For FY22, some of the things we're going to be taking a look at are implementing improvements to the, the parking system, um, looking at our procedure manuals and, and modernize, modernizing those a little bit. Um, and we'll have more COVID grants uh, to manage going forward as well. The accounting department, we're uh, primarily responsible for tracking all the financial activity and led by our rock, Sonia. Um, and FY21 did a lot of work around improving our procurement system, streamlining processes with uh, human resources and payroll. And uh, a big challenge was um, planning for the retirement of two key staff. Um, we have two longtime employees uh, are either retired already or planning to retire just after the fiscal year ends. And so a lot of work has gone into preparing for them, their replacements. 
Um, and in FY22, accounting is going to be looking at ways to continue improving our payroll and accounts payable processes. On the treasurer side, uh, Sherry Boucher, she's responsible for managing all of the, the town's funds. And I want to take a minute to acknowledge all of Sherry's work. Sherry is retiring in September, maybe October, if I can convince her to stay a little <laughs> bit longer. Um, she's been with the town over 30 years. She is a meticulous manager of, of the town's money and has done an amazing job. Um, she's stepped into roles when she's had to and done a great job. And, um, and this has been a busy year. I'll talk more about what she's done in a second. But um, Sherry, do you want to take a second and say anything? And does anybody want to thank Sherry for all her work? I just want to thank the town itself for keeping me all these years. Um, I've always enjoyed my job, the people, um, the public, especially. I always enjoyed helping everyone, whether it's getting them a tax bill or helping them figure out how to pay it. So I just want to say thank you for all the years. It's been a long haul. <laughs> and we thank you for all of the years and the long haul. Really. And the amazing thank amount you. of work you've done and how well you have managed our funds and thank you. Thank you. And I just want to jump in here too because Sherry is one of those people who, when I first started what she's always been the person who's been um knew what the what what the deal was especially on the first floor right she, she every people confide in her and she she knows what reality is and can set you straight when you need to be set, set straight and um but her integrity, I think, is the thing that's most remarkable, not remarkable, it's just who she is. And it's the thing that we most value about her in terms of just her friendship and everything. But just she has, you know, Sean said something about how she has, she follows every dime of the town <laughs> relentlessly. And you should actually talk about, I think, her most recent accomplishment, which is the latest bond rates that we just got. Yeah, Which is um, pretty. one of the big projects that Sherry helped lead is we just went out for a big, uh, we just did our first bond in five years, which is a lot more work than just doing a, a short-term borrowing. And there's a lot of um, documents that have to be pulled together and a tight, a tight timeline. And, and Sherry and, and Sonia really did a great job under very uh, condensed schedule getting all that together. Um, and the rates. And the, oh, and our rates are amazing rates are, are we have a 10 year bond for $5 million and the rate is about 1.07%. Mm -hmm. And we did a $2 million short-term borrowing and the rate was about 0.33%. Um, probably two of the lowest interest rates we've ever had would be my guess. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's gonna be a, a very difficult thing to replace Sherry. She's been amazing at training other people. That's another thing she's really great at is um, cross training and teaching other people what she does. and and she has very good notes about what she does. You know, we joke around some of the notes that we found. I won't bring up one about Google um, that came up <laughs> that came up a little while ago. Um, but let's just say that you know, uh, Google became a thing while Sherry was doing all this work. And right. so, um, and so Sherry's just you know she's going to be. We're going to miss her tremendously, and um, we're lucky that we've had her. So I'll keep going and- um, Oh, you know, I think Lynn, I don't know, Lynn, did you have you something? Want to say something? To you unmute though. Thank you. So Sherry, thank you so much. You've been amazing. I understand you're the person to go to when you want to know where the dead bodies are buried. <laughs> so please, please make sure that you let uh, Sean know all of that back information. Uh, more importantly, uh, having just retired myself three years ago, could I advise you don't run for local government? <laughs> um, it's not retirement. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for your many, many years of service. I understand you're one of our longest term employees. 35 years is a long time. Like and uh, we really wish you the best. And hopefully we might even get to see you in person before you walk out the door. Yeah. Thank you. Great. All right, I will keep moving on. Um, the, the next office is the collector's office, which is led by Jen LaFountain, um, responsible for working the counter, uh, receiving all the bill payments, property taxes, all those things that come into the town, all the revenues of the town go through Jen's office. Um, so the high focus on customer service and, and making people feel um, welcome when they come in and when they talk to them on the phone. 
um, and FY21 projects included, uh, primary uh, a project was putting a lot of our ways of paying bills online so that they could work could continue to be done um, remotely. Um, and the collector's office was a major, uh, played a major role in reviewing all of our fees. We did a, a fee review comparing to other towns and looking, getting all our fees in one place. And um, they led a lot of that. And for FY22, we're gonna be taking a look at some of our longstanding ambulance billing agreements and the methodologies and how that works and also our, our cannabis agreements um, and getting all those things up, up to date as much as possible. And then the final department within finance is the assessor's office led by Elizabeth Duffy. And the assessor's office does you know, all the appraisal of ta uh, properties in town, um, gathering all the data, helping establish the tax rate, um, getting money for the town you know, is, is a major uh, function for, of that office. Um, and FY21, she helped streamline some of our processes to make the, the data flow between our software databases uh, without sort of the manual entry of it. It kind of comes in automatically now, which is great. Um, and she did a lot of work on the residential exemption study. And for FY22, we're gonna uh, hopefully finalize the residential exemption study and bring information back to the council. Uh, we'll be introducing the PACE program to you uh, at some point during FY22, which is a, a financing mechanism for sustainable um, uh, improvements for commercial properties and, and multifamily properties. Um, and an, another thing we, we've, Liz and I have talked about a lot is how do we improve communication to residents about the different um, programs that are available to them, um, ones that may be struggling financially or, or whatever it may be. There's different exemptions that are out there and how do we do a um, improve the way we communicate to people so they're aware of these things. And that's about it for the finance office. So I will turn it back to you all for questions and we're all ready to answer them. Uh, Kathy. I'm gonna start with the last thing you said, um, and I'm glad to hear that Liz is trying to figure out how it would be easier for people to know what they could get and where to apply. Because I, I heard a discussion also for the Community Preservation Act that mm -hmm. you can apply. And one of the points they made is you, you can't assume that if you got it one year that you've got it for the next year, you have to know to reapply. And so, you know, if you're doing the real estate property taxes or the other one, I think it would, be such a service if there was some easy place to go <laughs> that you had a Q&A that would tell people, you know, who might be eligible. And then if you know it, Liz, but if someone else can also steer someone, we had one question that came in directly to the council. And I was trying to think of who exactly do we send this to? Is this, and the only person I could think of was you, but um, so if, Many of us would be more than happy as district counselors, I think, to do one district meeting that's saying to the extent you do or don't know about this, this is what you could have. And here's where you would go to just, you know, do a quick look because people don't know that um, at all, it, either at all or they know vaguely, maybe. Um, so I, I commend you on trying to find a single place you could actually go and find out in layperson's language, um, what you might qualify for would be Liz, great. Liz, do you want to talk about the um, the flyer that we're thinking of putting in with the property tax bill um, this year that addresses some of what Kathy was just describing? Well, um, with the tax bill, we're going to hopefully put in what our personal exemption qualification criteria might be and where to go to find those applications and more information. If you would like to find out today about those inform that information, including a link to the tax, wa tax work off, it's also on our web page. But our office uh, facilitates the personal exemptions and things of that nature. Um, we're working on the, the uh, PACE program as well, uh, so that perhaps we can have that in the future, which would also offer some financing for things. But um, you know, we, we try to make it one-stop shopping just on that page. But, Always, if any citizen is interested in uh, possibly getting help, uh, please send them my way. I will do everything I can to point them in the right direction. And if I don't have the answer, I get back to them really quickly so that I can point them to the right person. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Bob, take me. I just had a question. It's on page 77, the service levels and 
uh, I'm looking at the tax dollars abated, um, both in terms of absolute dollars and it's a percent of levy and it appears to be going up over time. Is that just noise or is there some trend there that we need to be aware of? Would you like me to address that? Yeah, Liz, why don't you weigh in? So uh, Rob, just or Bob, sorry, just to um, confirm, you're talking about the line where it goes from $36,095 in FY19 to $177,419 in FY20? Right, and it starts at okay. 8000 in FY16, so. Sure, um, yeah, Liz, why Certainly. don't you over time? Well, you know, it depends on who appeals, you know, mm -hmm. who submits that abatement. And in that particular period, we had uh, a more, uh, a larger appellants and things like that. We had some large, um, larger properties. And the other thing that you need to look at is the increase in the mill rate will also impact that, the tax rate. Yeah, and the one thing I'll add, um, I can see why you think, why that looks like a trend going up. The one thing I'll say is the way we budget um, the, the allowance for abatements and exemptions is, I think it's, it's a percentage of the 1% of the property tax, Sonia, right? Is that correct? Yes. Um, and so that is, a, we've never, yeah, so we have that sort of standard and we, we haven't come really close to using that all in a, in a couple of years, we, maybe longer. We've generally had more than enough in that allowance. Um, so it does look like a trend. I can see why you're looking at that, but overall we're doing very well um, at keeping the overall level of abatements and uh, really abatements low. Yeah, and I did ask whether it was just ran, you know, just noise, because I can understand it depends on who appeals and yeah. how the property is and all that. So, um, okay, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> so, general finance question: uh, This has been a tough year, in order because uh, we've had so many changes and so many unusual things going on in the year that's. Um, transpired with grants and different funding sources, different expenditures that were unanticipated. Uh, has, uh, do, do, did you feel, um, it seems from the outside that our systems were set up, that you guys uh, really pulled it off well. Was there any stresses that, um, in lessons that you learned from this? Andy, I could share Excel workbooks that would knock your socks off. All right. <laughs> like the, the, um, so, you know, we, the, the good thing is we do have a great accounting department, um, you know, that keep, has very tight controls over things. Everything is in order uh, between Sonia and Holly and the rest of the team. You know, that's never a worry. Um, the hardest part about all of that that you just described has been the changing guidance throughout this entire process. I think, you know, there was over 10 eligibility changes in the CARES grants. Um, you know, it was extended, obviously, by a year. Um, the, you know, there's things that were eligible in the beginning that are no longer eligible and vice versa. Um, so that's really been the struggle is trying to keep up with uh, what's eligible, what's not eligible. How do we maximize the use of funds with all these different um, versions of grants? Uh, one thing we did um, a few months ago or maybe just over a month ago is we um, hired a um, sort of a dedicated CARES grant manager, um, who's just focused on the, gr the grant, not full-time, but part-time, um, staying up to date and working with staff. And, and that person's working on CARES, but also on the FEMA side of it. The FEMA applications are very time consuming. Um, you have to enter invoices by line item. And, you know, when you're buying, you know, between the schools and the town, you know, lots of cleaning supplies and PP and E and all you can, all the things you can imagine. Um, it's a very time consuming process. So, um, I think overall it's gone very well, thanks to the the people um, in the accounting department and the person we hired. Um, but it has been an, it's been a big challenge to kind of stay on top of it. I, uh, I for one, just want to thank all of you for staying together and managing our way through what I know must have been an incredible year with just so many new things thrown at us on all sides, so thank you. Dorothy, you had a question? Um, it's to, to do with the auto tax. Um, it might be kind of gimmicky, but you could offer um, a reduction for electric cars. Have you thought about that? Are you talking about for um, motor vehicle excise tax? Yeah. 
I don't do. I don't think we have control over that, Jen. Do we? No, we don't. I actually, I had that question come up from a constituent, and went back and read the statute and looked at the uh, all of the Department of Revenue guidance and uh, the bills. Uh, I mean, the the whole um, evaluation system on which it's based is state driven. It's not something we have control over. So, Kathy? Yeah, I just, um, it has nothing to do with what we're looking at on the books, although I see parking permits issued. And Sean has already told us that he's going to be our parking guru going forward, kind of think of it. But one of the thoughts, and I sent Sean a memo on some thinking about this, I think we could, with a parking permit, give a, to the extent we had a, a rational rating system, fee system, which I'm not sure we have, you could give a lower fee for an electric car because that's completely under our control in the way we do it. So if we wanted to say we'd like clean cars on our streets would be better, but I think we do have lever We That's something that we could think about if it didn't make your work even more complicated on different, now it's just everyone pays the same fee, I think. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a great, um, that was a great observation. So, so Jen and I actually walked around yesterday morning. Um, we're trying to walk around sort of the entire downtown from different angles and and with the recommendations we've read and um, information away from planning um, and just kind of start jotting down all the things that we think are possibilities or uh, uh, things we want to bring forward. And then we also had a good conversation with the planning department yesterday as well, because they've They've lived through a lot of this for the last 10, 15, 20 years. They've been through a lot of studies and reports and um, it was really helpful to get their perspective on what we saw, um, things that they've probably, they've already seen. Um, and, and that was one of the things that came up was, um, A, we got to look at our whole permit system because it's been some time since it's sort of had a, a complete look overdue or overhaul. Um, not that we're going to do an overhaul, but since we've really changed anything in a dramatic way. Um, but also within that, do, do we want to have some sort of in, uh, way to continue incentivizing EV vehicles, hybrid or fully electric um, came up. So that, I think that's a good suggestion and one that we're looking at. Great. Mr. Kubiak. Real quick, um, the American Planning Association just started a whole uh, series of, of articles on the billion dollar curbside. So getting the planning department involved in that is, is a good idea. They make the point that the way we use curb, the curbs, um, we use curbs right now in a very inefficient way. So there's a lot of different ways to, to do that. I'd be a little concerned about uh, discounting just electric uh, EV cars because they're new, they're expensive. And folks who have more modest incomes aren't likely to own one. Um, so that's a that's a problem. And then finally, I really do want to, having seen the municipal finance uh, stuff from multiple perspectives, I really do want to congratulate or th thank the the finance crew um, in in general for the the great work that they've done and continue to do. It's really a thicket of rules, regs, and crazy making stuff, and they've managed to uh, to. to to triumph over all of it. So thank you. Agreed. So um, anything else people have in the way of questions regarding the finance department? Andy, I have a couple other little um, sections that I was gonna, okay. I was gonna go over to um, general services debt and the other assessments in OPEB. Do you want me just to kind of go through those briefly and then see if there's questions on those areas? Yes, and um, go ahead. Okay, um, so general services. Um, actually, Sonia, do you want to talk about general services a little bit? That's where our legal line is, but what else goes on in general services? I love the warning you give me. <laughs> right, put me right on the spot. Uh, yeah, so general services, there's two parts to it. There's um, the 1198, which pays for the audit. And um, now that's where we moved legal to. I can't think of what other service. Our liability insurance, I think, is in there as well, right? Yeah, I don't have it in front of me because I wasn't prepared. 
hey, accounting, if you look at the org chart, it says accounting and then general services. So, so um, accounting is pretty much in charge of that whole operating budget. We do, um, we take care of the audit. We do the bids for the property and casualty insurance and so on. The other part, the other 1199 is mostly services and um, central purchasing. And that, that's also monitored through the, the, we pay for the mail machine, any mailing services out of that account. Like I said, I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, and the one thing I'll add, Sonia, on the property and casualty insurance, that's something that we're seeing a um, potentially a large increase. We've got it in the budget, but it, um, they're not so much for what's going on around here, but what's going on around the world, um, You know, whether it be hurricanes or floods, um, Mm -hmm. uh, we saw a pretty large, you know, we had a big decrease in our property and casualty insurance when we bid it out. And now we're seeing some of the costs start to rise again because of what's going on um, throughout the country. So that's a, an area we have to monitor closely. Um, so I'll go to the next two sections and then see if there's questions. So the next section is debt. Um, so that's page 192 in the operating budget. And um, so debt's sort of a moving target. It's always sort of a point in time. Again, we put this together before we just bid out, um, before not bid out, before we just did our bond issuance and our, our ban, which was literally um, Tuesday and Wednesday that happened. Um, so this will be changed a little bit, hopefully for, for the better because we um, because of the rates that we just uh, received. Um, and I think the thing to know here is that this budget proposal includes a few debt authorizations. Um, there are some uh, projects within the capital plan. I believe it is a pumper truck for the fire department, a sweeper for um, public works, and then the chiller for the police station um, that we're proposing a borrowing authorization. And then there's also the design and project management um, work for a potential new fire station and DPW building. Um, so the, I believe those are the five that are in the, um, the authorizations that are part of this budget. And then the last thing, and then I see there's a question, is other assessments and OPEB. Um, the big things here are the PVTA assessment, um, charter tuition, retirement assessment from Hampshire County, and other post-employment benefits. Um, for PVTA and charter, there are reimbursements for those. So you'll see the full cost in this section of the budget, but then there's reimbursements on the revenue side. Um, PVTA, we receive offsets from uh, whether it be UMass or um, Amherst or five colleges. And on the pension side, you know, pension is one of those things that we do need to keep uh, an eye on. Um, we did, we had our bond rating affirmed, which was great. Um, there were a couple areas that were sort of uh, identified as areas we could improve. One of them is sort of the combination of our pension and retiree health insurance costs. Um, they're at a certain level that, uh, you know, is, is maybe slightly above what the bond rating agencies would like. And so, you know, we, we cannot, it's hard to make immediate changes in those areas because those are sort of long-term liabilities. But when we think about, um, when we talk about adding positions, um, benefit levels, all those things sort of play into our long-term liability around those areas. Um, and so it's just things to keep in mind, not that that dictates what we, the town decides to do, but, um, it can have an impact on our pension assessment or our retiree health insurance costs. And then the other piece there is the OPEB, other post-employment benefits. Um, we did reduce that from 500,000 um, as a contribution in FY20 down to 250,000 in FY21. And we're proposing bringing that back to 300,000 for FY22. We do wanna keep getting that up to where it was at least to 500,000. Um, that was another area that was identified in the, so the bond rating is that, um, we do have a plan, but the, you know, in the, in the opinion of the bond rating agency, I think, and, and pretty much every other community in the state, they don't view it as a sufficient plan to actually uh, fund the liability anytime soon. And so we need to do some work on, on that plan and making sure that um, you know, we, can, we can demonstrate that to them in the future. Um, Sean, can I just add one thing? Yeah. You were talking about the capital plan and the borrowing articles. Yeah. Um, I just want to mention that there's also the fire station facility design and engineering, as well as the uh, public works facility in there. Right, both of them. Plan. Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. That was all out there. Hmm. I see that you have questions. 
Uh, yeah, well, it, it's a question and a comment. Um, it's something I asked earlier, and it's on this. The jump, the it's not insubstantial. So what Sonia just did, it's um, the schematic design for fire plus DPW is 3.4 million. Mm -hmm. And so none of that shows up in the FY22 budget, but what you see in the FY23 budget is a jump in debt service, which is those plus the library, plus other things I realize of 1.5 million. And um, what I then went and looked at is what's what are we allocating for the operating budget increase that year and it's less than 2% increase. I can't find anything that tells me what you think is going to happen with health insurance, you know, out for FY, you know, we don't do a forecast on it. Mm -hmm. But I'm my my question comment is that we are going to be making a recommendation about the whole budget. We haven't really had a discussion on the implications of what we decide for 22 on what it, what we're going to be facing in FY23 because it's an even everyone has seen what the, the discussion has been around a budget that was able to go operating budget that was able to go up by 2.2% if we're at 1.9% and health insurance was negative this year or flat so we've got step increases built into people. So I'm worried that we are, and you've always said right from the beginning that FY23 was the tough year, Sean, but it's, it's, it's a really tough year. And we're making decisions now that will affect that. So Andy, it's a, how do, we had the brief of, of discussion with this potential way to do all the big projects in a five-year period, but if we are, we're also then making a decision about the future with this discussion. So I'm looking for carving out a little more time than just looking at this. And I had to you know, piece together looking forward what, what this year's decision for FY22 will mean for FY23, 24. It looks a little bit better when you get to 24, 25, but not great. You know, it, um, so, and I, I know we're then in the real forecast world, but it has an implications for when we talk next Thursday about the CREST program and the community safety, if we want to do anything that's new program, um, uh, where does the money come from? So I, it, so it's over in the capital side affects the operating budget side, and you can only see it by sort of jumping around. You can, it's there, it's not hidden. It's just in different parts and different pages. Kathy, and I just wanna ask real quick, um, did, did you look at the uh, sort of the four year projection on page 44 and 45? Sorry, you're muted. Yeah, I found the projection that okay. went out multiple years on okay. the revenue side, so I could see both the operating budget and the capital budget and see the jump up in debt service expense, which is because we're making, and you said it's not just, it's also some trucks and other things, the chiller, some other things that are in yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, we, we try to really make that debt projection everything that we potentially might borrow. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think the place to look is page 44 and 45. I think the improvement I could make next year, we could make next year in the budget book is, um, maybe put more information about the actual assumptions that are used in those out years. Cause it, you kind of, you can't really tell what we're assuming for some of those different variables around health insurance or, um, or things. So that's, we could put some sort of key that shows what the assumptions are in those out years, I think would be helpful. Um, but I think to your point in FY23, you know, we're, we're the projections for a 2%, inc I think it's roughly a 2% increase in the operating budget. Um, and then going back to two and a half percent in 24, 25 and 26. Um, so again, that 23 still could change. We're going to find out a lot this year, how quickly we recover. So it could be better. It could be a little bit worse. Um, I don't anticipate it being much worse than the 2%, but, um, uh, but we'll see this year when we start, you know, when the college and universities come back. And I, I do understand, you know, we're in the crystal ball when we get out. It's, it, we're already, don't know for sure next year, but two years from now. But I'm just, as we look at those schematic design, the library has been voted right now, but if we look at schematic design, some, do we postpone something because we become more insured? And then health insurance, we were, when you look at that employee benefit line, 
it is so unusual to see no increase. I mean, that's just a gift. That's not what the norm has been. Um, so we've been, most of the operating budget then has been salaries, not usually the big hit that's been health insurance, you know, combating with it. So I'm just, I'm more worried than I, um, more, more worried about 23 than I am about 22. Yeah. Sure. So I have a question. Um, I was um, fretting about OPEB expenses um, and how how are we ever going to catch up? And um, the person I was speaking with said, "You're never going to catch up. No one is ever going to catch up on OPEB. It's not possible." I said, "Well, then what's going to happen? Our employees not going to get their benefits?" And the answer I got was. It's going to have to be taken over by the federal government uh, into single payer uh, insurance or whatever. Um, that's where we're going to have to go because although we are doing a really good job, most other places aren't and they're going to be crashing and saying they can't do it. So given that as a possibility in the future, is it better or worse to be, to, to be really uh, prudent as we are, trying very hard to catch up on our OPEB? This is a thought question. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't, I think we were at a roughly 10% funded, which given the size of the liability and, you know, relatively short amount of time that we've been funding it, I think is pretty good. Um, you know, our plan is, you know, we're putting a, we're really focusing funding, not by choice, but by law, a lot of our additional funding is going towards the pension liability um, as sort of the number one piece to get fully funded. And that's on track to be fully funded FY 23 or 33 or 34. Um, and once that's fully funded, the expectation is that the, the assessment we get from the Hampshire County Pension Assist, um, System is gonna drop by a lot because a, a pretty large chunk of our assessment each year is for this past unfunded liability that we're catching up on. And so um, our town and many other towns, um, you know, previous finance director here, you know, was part of his plan is that once we do get that drop in nine or 10 years um, in the pension system is that we would put some of that savings towards um, getting o OPEB fully funded. I don't think we can rely on the federal government taking it over um, as a strategy. Uh, maybe that would happen, I'm not sure. I, I know, you know, we're probably better funded than the state is when it comes to other post-employment benefits. Um, but we, it's something that we, we do take seriously. It is a liability. The auditors look at it. The bond rating agencies look at it. Um, and I think I think you're right that we are doing better than many other communities and, and we want to kind of keep that ship going in the right direction. Right, so thank you for reminding me that it really does, no matter what happens, it helps our bond rating, which really helps us all. So thank you. And, you know, and, and, the, and the long term sustainability pieces, um, you know, our retiree health insurance costs on an annual basis are rising pretty sharply. Um, and if we, you know, the goal is if you get enough money set aside in this, in this fund, you can help mitigate those annual increases. Um, you know, we're really making investments now for 20 or 30 years down the road. But if we don't make those investments now, 20 or 30 years down the road, things could be in really bad, you know, much, much worse shape than they are now. Um, so, that, you know, we're really making an investment in the future um, and trying to pay our fair share now so that we don't pass on these really high uh, retiree health insurance costs to future generations. Okay, anything else? Uh, Kathy, did you have something you were? No, I was just gonna say, I can talk to Dorothy directly since I'm following all the federal Things. The interaction with public or private sector on healthcare is not as straightforward as even as you just talked about it. So, so it's good that we are paying. You have to understand we are paying every year for our retiree health insurance. We're just not pre-funding it, and almost no one in the private sector has totally pre-funded their healthcare liability. Um, what they have been doing is cutting back on benefits, and we've got a pretty what I had just heard, I we've got a good package that our people are going out with. <laughs> so I'll just I'll just stop there. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the you know I've heard this mentioned by others. I think one of the 
you know, public sector employees, you know, think about municipal employees don't usually make as much as you can make in the private sector. But one of the areas where you kind of offset it a little bit is with benefits um, generally being better than in the private sector. So I think it's a, a give and take on that front. Uh, I, I, I can just uh, say a little bit of my experience from the private sector and basically uh, health insurance, I, I retired. Uh, I was one of the last people probably that had a, what we would consider a good health insurance policy with a PPO. And uh, the people who were hired up at, you know, a few years ago uh, basically just were given a catastrophic health insurance policy, which you know, really doesn't uh, do much for you. Um, the company paid some of the premiums, but it, I'm telling you, it's even in the private sector, the uh, the benefit right now is not getting better; it's getting worse. And we did just um, to round that out. You know, we did. Um, we are also trying to manage the cost side of the equation as well. Not um, we did switch to Maya a few years ago, which. Um, did make the benefits not as good as they were before because we introduced things like deductibles and um, and co-pays changed a little bit. Um, so so we are also sort of actively managing the cost side um, in addition to the uh, pre-funding and setting aside money for the future. Okay, anything else that we wanna talk about regarding uh, finance and the whole bundle of issues that have followed in the discussion? So if not, we have a number of staff here who've uh, come and I really appreciate it. Yeah. And, uh, trip back to Sean to... All right. The next, where you to go next. The next department is human resources. And our human resources director, Donna Ray, is here to uh, give you an overview of her department. Hi, everybody. Hello. Nice to meet you all, kind of. Maybe someday in person, I hope. Um, so as Sean said, my name's Donna Ray Keneally, and I'm the Director of Human Resources. I've also invited, you'll see our HR manager, Joanne Misiezek, here to attend and see what we're doing here as well. So the Human Resources Human Rights Department is made up of one full-time HR director, one full-time HR manager, and we have a half-time administrative um, assistant. And HR is responsible for, and I know this is kind of written in the budget book, but I'm just gonna give you the overview. Um, so we're responsible for recruitment, hiring, onboarding, some training, employee relations, and administering employee benefits. I am new to the town. I started on October 26th, so finishing up seven months. It's been very busy. Um, a couple of things that we are working on. So prior to my appointment, the town engaged um, a municipal HR consultant called Human Resources Services to review our compensation and classification program for our part-time temporary and seasonal positions. And we are using, um, that information and their recommendation to implement a new classification plan wage chart for our part-time seasonal positions effective 7-1. Um, we have over 700 part-time temporary and seasonal employees that'll be, um, you know, that were included in that study. We're also in the midst of labor negotiations with the fire department. Um, as you can imagine, I, I think, um, one of the things that really keeps us busy is the pandemic response. Um, because of all of the uncertainty um, related to the pandemic, HR was really, I think, a vital area in terms of serving as both a consultant for leadership and a counselor to employees. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to protect our employees. Um, we work closely with the health director um, based on mass public health guidelines. And we've updated uh, many times our standard operating procedures, which are our safety guidelines for on-site staff. Um, we've developed a COVID-related remote work policy. We've um, updated travel policies and um, all sorts of stuff like that that's just kind of ongoing and changing. Um, we've ensured that the EAP is available and um, talked with our employees about um, health 
coverage for um, a lot of the mental health issues that have arisen or, or did arise during the pandemic. Um, just, you know, the uncertainty, the stress of it all, isolation in some cases. So um, you name it and it's been developed, reviewed, updated and changed um, related to the pandemic. So we've been working on that and we're happily moving in the right direction um, with reopening. So um, you might imagine, and you probably have heard that recruitment has been challenging because um, I would imagine probably because of the excellent unemployment benefits provided by the Commonwealth. So we've been thinking of um, creative ways to attract talent and our um, the town's communications manager, Brianna, has been very helpful in helping us to um, make flyers and recruit to, uh, recruit to different social media platforms. Let me see. I think it's also important to talk with you about um, that it's been about a year since George Floyd um, took his last breath. And so the town, I think a lot of you know, is focused on addressing systemic racism. And to that end, you might be aware that the town became a member of the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. Um, it's called, that program's called GARE, and they're a national network of governments that work to achieve racial equity and advance opportunities for everyone. Um, and, and then in addition, the town formed its own core equity team. And I'm the chair of the core equity team, along with my co-chair, uh, Jennifer Moyston. And um, I could tell you about the mission and, and, and read about the mission to you. Um, but also I do wanna let you know that Jennifer recently developed a, a training. We've also actually talked about um, or worked with consultants about kind of where to go next. And we're in the process of engaging with those consultants. Um, I, does anyone have any questions so far? I'm just, I'm going on. I'm looking for questions. I don't see anyone yet. Okay, I'll, I'll keep going then. So let me also just quickly tell you that we also work on employee benefits. So we went through a health insurance renewal. Um, as Sean mentioned a little while ago, the town is with Maya. And I think that we use, um, we, we get greater discounts through Maya by uh, belonging to this collaboration. And we had a great renewal this year. They actually called it, um, a 1.1% premium increase, but then also gave us a premium holiday, um, which the employees and town will enjoy in November of 2021, which is for coverage for the month of December. So, and I think that's related to the fact that um, when the pandemic started, a lot of people stopped going out for healthcare. So there wasn't a, there wasn't a huge um, cost to the insurance companies, I think we've seen. So, um, and I, I, I forget who, maybe Catherine, someone mentioned what's going to happen next year. And I agree, I'm, I'm wondering what's going to happen next year. We will, we will see about that. Um, but this for FY22, it was really good. Um, in terms of benefits, the town also offers some voluntary plans so that there's no cost to the town there. Um, it's just, a, I think, a nice thing for the town to do, use its group buying power to offer things like dental and vision plans to employees if they want. And um, we're currently working on the life insurance renewal, but I think those are the highlights and, and there's a lot of stuff mentioned in the budget book as well. Kathy? Uh, yeah, I had a couple questions. Um, I'll, I'll start when um, you said that you were doing a review of compensation for part-time seasonal and temporary and there were over 700 people in that category. Does, when you do that, is that just the town or are you also looking at schools? So that's 700 or schools and library. Is that, you know, what? what's- It's, it's not schools. Okay. And that is just, I mean, that's from every temporary, I mean, election workers, um, our call okay. force for the fire department, every, every, every position that essentially is not a full-time position, I would include in, in that. Okay. Okay. The second one is on um, health benefits and Maya. Do you get to, do, does, I'm, I think probably the answer is yes, but do you get a report to show you uh, what kinds of reserves they've built up? Because yes, the, the, what the COVID did was people stopped going to the doctor and the hospital and electrics. So a lot of uh, electives, so a lot of, um, there's been 
pressure on large companies, big insurers, to give back money. So it's really nice that they've given us the holiday. Do we get an accounting? And I realize we're part of a bigger pool to see how much they built up during that time period. So, well, I mean, we are, we're fully insured, so we don't, we, we, we do get a lot of information, but I don't, I don't recall talking with them about the reserves, oh, but I, yeah. is in the, oh, go ahead. Since I worked there pre previously. Uh, <laughs> so they, Maya Health and Benefits Trust has about $400 billion in, um, in assets. And, and so, and they, um, they're well capitalized and are very careful. They, they have one partner, Blue Cross Blue Shield that they work with. Um, they, um, they have lots of actuaries that look at their reserve status and things like that. They only insure cities and towns and, and uh, local government entities. They're the largest insurer um, the, between the GIC and Maya. Those are the two largest insurers of public employees in the state. Um, so they, they're incredibly conservative uh, in terms of maintaining assets to cover their, um, their costs going forward. You know, and I didn't, and Paul, I didn't mean it that, you know, it, there was a reserve that was specific to Amherst. I'm just, no. you know, I'm just saying that the premium flow in, um, we've had a very unusual year and a half, year plus where the expenditures plummeted in terms of use of the hospital, use of, you know, getting hip replacements, you know, just a, along a whole long list going to the doctor. So, somewhere in that healthcare world, there's a pot of money and it looks like the premium holiday was part of the way of giving yeah. it back to us. Yeah. So the Maya board of directors is made up of local officials. It's all um, managers um, and HR directors and things like that. That's who makes up the board of directors for the Maya. And they're the ones who vote on these types of things. And they're all people like me and who then say, we've got a lot of money in the bank. We should give a premium holiday type thing. Thanks, you, Chris. Oh, Paul, I could have told him that. No, just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I was looking at the, um, on, on page 85, the family coverage, individual coverage numbers. And I was just ch trying to see if there was trends on employees choosing uh, family coverage versus individual coverage, if there was a, if they had an option, um, and of course, uh, family that has uh, um, multi with multiple employers usually goes to the best deal. Are we still an employer that is um, getting a disproportionate share of employees choosing to be covered by us? Um, I don't know that to be. I mean, I don't think there's been any um, major changes. I mean, we did a, the big change that happened was when we went to Maya and we did a full re-enrollment, um, yeah. which means everybody, you know, before if you were enrolled, it just kind of carried over. When we went to Maya, everyone had a re-enroll and we saw a pretty big change in um, how many were in family plans versus single plans and how many were in HMOs versus PPOs. Um, and so there were some benefits that way. And some people also choose, uh, took advantage of switching off of the plan for a variety of reasons at that point as well. Um, so I don't, yeah, it's hard to answer that question, um, but I know our, you know, our healthcare coverage uh, benefits are still strong. They're not, um, uh, you know, compared to others, other employers in the community. So I think we still have a strong benefit package relative to, to UMass or um, other entities. Dorothy? Uh, this is a question about hiring from within. Um, and I'm reminded of uh, two things um, in, um, I guess it was the evaluation of the town manager last year. Um, some, an employee comment, some employees said they don't hire from within. And uh, I know right now HCC is all stirred up because the new president hired a lot of consulting firms, brought in a lot of people from the outside, didn't even notify people who've been with, you know, working for the college for years that there was a new position and it you know, caused a lot of problems. So um, wanting to know whether, what your provisions for hiring for within and retraining are within the organization. So I'll, I'll start that and Donna Ray, you can jump on. So under the charter, we're required to post all of our jobs uh, externally 
uh, unless it's a, you know, uh, uh, someone's changing job titles or something like that. And we do that. And, um, you know, I, I am a firm believer in supporting growth in our own, uh, of our own workforce. Um, but we also want to make sure that we um, are, we're also actively trying to diversify our workforce as well. And we know that we aren't diverse right now. And so that's a piece of it. And that's one of the reasons we do additional outreach. But when, you know, we want to provoke, it's how we retain good employees is by providing growth opportunities as well. So it's a fine balance that we, that we follow. Donna Ray, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think that you're exactly right. I think it, the charter does say that we do advertise um, every, every new permanent position. And so we do that. Um, I, there is growth opportunity from within. We've just had, in fact, our um, management assistant in the town clerk's office just became the assistant town clerk, but it was a whole process. And I think that you're exactly right, Paul. The reason is because we are trying to diversify the workforce. And so we, we do want to, um, our, and by the charter, we have to um, post those positions. So, um, but I hear you, Dorothy, and I do, agree, I, I like promotion from within. It's a great thing. And it's how we keep our best talent. I just want to add one thing that I, I know that some of the feeling at the community college is might be similar to in town, which is the full-time staff uh, through loyalty, see the organization through times of difficulty and trouble, such as we've had this year. And I know that our, at least from what Paul has reported, our town staff, they have learned new things, worked across in other departments and have shown a lot of loyalty. And, you know, I understand the need for diversity too. We all do. So maybe you'll have to hire some additional people in order to, to both do justice to your staff that has been loyal with you and flexible during this time and to get the diversity, which we all agree we need. I, I love the way you think. Paul, do you have anything to? to... Yeah, any other questions or comments regarding uh, human resources, human rights? Human rights, of course, has become a major activity of its own with all of the demands from uh, that we start thinking about the diversity issues uh, and the community response program and everything else that's coming along. It's a very conscious community about those topics. Yes. So how'd I do for my first time? All you right. Good. Okay. All right. I was just going to say, it's very nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. It's yeah. very nice to meet you all. And, and I'm yeah. glad that Paul and Sean are here too, to help me when I'm like, oh, what's the answer there? And I should say to meet both of you, even though Joanne has been notably quiet as we pepper you with questions, but it's, it's great to meet you. Thank you. We, we, need, a you we need a town picnic. Yes. The workers, we face to face out in the green. I would love that. Yes. Donna Ray and Joanne make a tremendous team. We really appreciate their work. Joanne keeps us all healthy with all the uh, <laughs> the, uh, yes, fruit, that, the fruits and vegetables that get put in the uh, mention that. Yeah, I, can I mention that? So um, Joanne put in for a wellness grant through Maya, as a matter of fact, and got almost twenty thousand dollars. And she's got. I mean, we have Fitbits. We have. Um, they're like this, but they're way better. They're like flasks that say the town of Amherst for water, but also she's getting fresh fruit and healthy oh. snacks delivered to every department. And, what about and the council? <laughs> <laughs> we should have. Um, you know what? It's really nice though, because it not only helps with wellness and keeping your minds on healthy eating, but I think it's been great because the employees feel like they've received like a nice appreciation from the town, even though we got it from this Maya grant, but it's just been so great. So I want to thank Joanne for getting that for the town. It's been awesome. Yay. Yes. I want to add one thing. I was, I was walking up North Pleasant street in the rain and a fire captain came running across the street in the rain and said, Paul, 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 I want to tell you, it's so great to get this box of fruit and vegetables because we're, we tend to walk across the CVS and buy candy. And now we have this healthy food there and we know we should be doing it and it's right there. So we don't even leave the station. Now we can get the things that we need. And he was just like, everybody on the force were really appreciated it. So it's those, it's the little things like that. And it's a healthy thing. And everybody wants to live a healthy life, but 
candy is so prevalent and so um, and delicious and delicious. <laughs> well, now we know there's not a lot of firehouse cooking. Maybe, <laughs> maybe now that they've got the maybe there's a vegetarian chili that will be a menu, the menu at the firehouse. Mm -hmm. Oh, we'll send them some peppers for that chili. There you go. That's right. I hope they share it, though. We're out of the fit, fit business, I gather. And, and another thing that's you happening. You know what that was about? The witch? I missed it. The, uh, this goes back some years now, that because uh, I think John was still the town manager then, that uh, yeah, human resources got Fitbits for everybody and was challenging everybody to uh, achieve walking distances. So we had people who we, were we, gone. And I would gone. show you my camera. We just got some more. We're ready to do it again. And we last or two years ago, we, we competed against Pittsfield, right, Joanne? You organized yes. that? Yeah. Yes, but we and, lost, unfortunately. Yeah, wow. steps. <laughs> but another thing that Joanne and um, Donna Ray are doing this week is recognizing uh, the first responders. Do you want to talk a little bit about the work you're doing for that? Um, sure, it's um, or is it a secret still. Well, it's, they don't know yet, but um, <laughs> yes. So we we're, we're getting some baskets together to bring over to um, fire and police to to in appreciation for everything they do, the various shifts, um, because we are very grateful to our first responders. I, I also want to I, I say I'm I'm i've worked a long time i started working when i was 17 and i'm 75 so i have quite a history uh, i looking at you re, having the staff respond in these meetings makes me realize what a real sense of camaraderie there is and what real collaboration is and i am very respectful of you paul but each and every one of you in the department because i i can see the kind of respect that's there. So thank you very much. Thank you for saying that. I feel that too. So how should we go, Sean? Gonna take your- Yeah, sorry. Um, thank you, Donna Ray. Um, so the next up is the town clerk who's gonna go through the town clerk's office, registrations um, and elections. And I just want to let people know I have to hop off a little before three o'clock for a American Rescue Plan webinar update um, from the state. So um, you'll see me jump off at that point. And at that point, um, I will be waiting for um, facilities management. It's yeah. So um, the two departments left will be the town clerk's office with the sections that Sue does, and then. Um, and then Jeremiah and and maybe um, Rob Mora will be here for facilities to go through the different sections of the budget. Um, so Sue, do you wanna um, give an overview of, of those three areas? Sure, um, I'm glad I came on quick because or early because uh, I missed something here. Sean Hannon was supposed to go at 245. Yeah, we switched the order. I won't say why, but we- Okay, um, <laughs> it's okay. But we switched the order. Okay, all right. Well, hello everybody. Um, for those, I see if there's anybody that doesn't know me, I'm Sue Audet, I'm the town clerk. I almost said acting town clerk, I'm the town clerk. <laughs> um, and I was just listening to Donna Ray talk about the food and I wanna announce that I am the food Nazi around here. Um, with the whole healthy eating, I've, I've gotten on the healthy eating bandwagon, whatever you wanna call that about four years ago. So I don't grab candy, I don't grab sugar. I specifically uh, just real whole foods. So anyway. Um, so this is my first time too. I'm not quite sure what is expected, but I just um, wrote up a little script of what's been going on in our office and what to look forward to in the future. So um, general government, so the town clerk side of things, as everybody knows, you probably heard this a few times already today or even in the past that this fiscal, this past fiscal year has been a challenge. Not only were COVID protocols in place, but we held three elections in our office, one of which was a very contentious presidential election. And we've had a departmental staffing shortage since September of 2020. So we've been down two people instead of three. All this has forced us to be especially flexible and creative. Many of the normal um, services that we provide had to either be put on hold or offered in a different way if possible. 
we were able to successfully implement an online portal for two of our most frequently requested services, which are vital records and dog licenses. That works out great. Um, we've also utilized as many other avenues as possible, such as meeting people outside town hall to receive paperwork or swear them into office, whatever else we can do outside of town hall. Services such as notarizations, passport applications and photos, and the taking of marriage intentions, those had to be put on hold because these are very labor intensive um, procedures and require a lengthy amount of face-to-face -face time. As a result of obviously revenues were down from levels in past years due to not being able to provide these services. On a positive note, um, we have successfully transitioned a new town clerk, me, and assistant town clerk, Amber Martin. And we have also just uh, recently completed the interview process for the management assistant position. We're currently in the um, negotiating process for that. This will bring us back up to full capacity. And with the opening of town hall shortly, we should be able to get back right away to offering our full complement of services. Um, one of the goals for the upcoming year under the town clerk section of the budget is going to be education on a personal side and on a townwide side. On the personal side, continuing education for the town clerk and assistant town clerk in working towards the certified municipal clerk designation is, is um, hopefully going to be happening. And onboarding the new management assistant will and getting them up to speed on office procedures will also be a priority. And then on the townwide side, education continues to involve conflict of interest training, open meeting law training, and knowledge of public records law. Now on to elections and registration. So as stated earlier, this past fiscal year, we successfully administered three elections, two of which happened during COVID times. We also dealt with new state election laws, sometimes on a daily basis, something new, um, that were implemented to compensate for the pandemic, such as the allowance of a ballot drop box, allowing for early voting by mail, and expanded, expanded early voting in person. This resulted in an increase in administrative and supply costs to handle the volume of requested ballots by mail and the need for additional election workers to help with the cleaning and line control at the polls. On a plus side though, we were reimbursed by the state auditors division for some of these early voting costs, actually in the amount of $24,814, which was nice. The challenges that we faced were met and they were overcome by the outpouring of support from many in the community and town staff and by the hiring of a third staff person to help specifically with the fall elections. We also applied for and we were awarded a grant by the Center for Tech and Civic Life, which we got in the amount of $34,051 to assist in the expenses incurred as a result of COVID, which was extremely helpful in many, many areas. Um, it allowed for the purchase of multiple supplies that would otherwise have uh, been paid for out of our elections budget, or we just simply wouldn't have purchased. And as stated earlier, the goal of education under elections specifically speaks to voter education. The town charter section 1010 states that the town implement right choice voting in Amherst for town elections, which will require the education of voters in a big way, as this is an entirely new way of voting. This educational campaign will be undertaken early, often, and through multiple media. The impact to our budget will not only be in advertising and personnel costs, but in equipment needed to read the new ballot style. And there is currently a capital request for this new voting equipment in this upcoming fiscal year's budget. Uh, we anticipate one upcoming town election on November 2nd. If not subject to COVID protocols at that time, we would not need the increased number of election workers as in this past fall and could staff each precinct as normal, which is about six workers per precinct instead of eight to 10. Challenges in elections continue to be polling place locations for many reasons, some of which include incompatibility as a polling site, the space is too small, there is insufficient parking or the site has security issues. Um, in summary, the biggest challenges to our budget are to add back one full-time staff member, the purchase of new voting equipment, and the outreach costs associated with ranked choice voting education. The offset to all this, of course, will be resuming all services, bringing revenue back up to prior uh, COVID levels. So I don't know if I've thrown questions at me. I, I probably missed a bunch of stuff, but I'm happy to answer anything anyone has.
looking for uh, Dorothy. Any clarification on ranked choice voting and whether it will be in place for the September, November election? It does not look that way. No, no, it's not gonna happen, is that it right? It does not look that way. We've not even been scheduled for a hearing okay. at the State House. Right. And if it, nothing happens by July 1, um, there's just no way to implement it. And even then it will be a serious stretch. I'd like to what add is passport. When will passports oh. be viable? When can you do that again? Paul, do you want to answer that question? We've decided to take them out of the clerk's office, but we were, um, I think Paul was going to look into moving them to another department. We have a conflict of interest with doing them in our office to begin with, because federal law changed in 2007, stating that if you are able to issue a birth certificate, you are not able to touch a passport application. So um, when I first started here in 2005, all three of us were able to be passport acceptance agents, but then that changed in 2007. We had to determine who does the passports and who does the vitals. And because by state law, town clerks and assistant town clerks must issue vital records, we had to pull the two, the, us two off and leave the management assistant alone on the passport. So it makes it very difficult, you know, when you're trying to offer services um, you say, oh, here, we're here Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30, and then that person's out on vacation or that person's out for a day, you know, one person has a hard time covering it all. So it stopped when we closed town hall. We actually withdrew from the program. Yeah, so um, I know there's talk about if we rejoin the program, who who is going to offer that in, in town hall? As you may know, Athena was our key person on that when she was working in the clerk's office. And, uh, you know, when when we terminated, when we closed town hall, it became something we couldn't support. Um, and we have to look at this carefully because I think, Sue, it, it was always an issue for the clerk's office to be able to accommodate it. It's a service. We don't have to provide it. The post office also provides it. But I think people, our experience has been that when, when we ran it, people loved coming to town hall because we gave them good service. And... Uh, were available and responsive to them. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at that again, because I think it's, it's, it's a good thing to offer to our, to our residents and other people who come here. Um, but we just be able to, have to be able to staff it and figure out if, we, if it's gonna be all the time or just under certain hours and things like that. And we have to have a backup person too. That's, and that's, uh, Athena knows more about the details of this. I wanna add one reason. You're gonna need more passports because to, everybody has to get that real, um, license but for someone like me who has um married widowed whatever i have a lot of names they said if i can't come up with papers for everything that i did in my life that the way to do it is to renew my passport then i can go get the real license the real id so there are going to be a lot of other people in my situation who are going to want to get a new passport yeah and if it's a renewal dorothy if you can just renew it you don't need an agent you just do it by by mail I let it lapse. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Kathy? Ranked choice voting. And when you said you're going to be out early and often, when is, so 2022 will the first, be the first time? No, we won't, there's no local. So you've got, no. you've got a big time, you've got time, okay. Yes. Two years. So I was going to ask just adequacy of staffing and early and often, and we can all watch what's happening, going to happen in New York City when they've got uh, the number of candidates they've got up for mayor, plus they've got all the other pieces. So we can, yeah. Okay. So, so it's not, it's not going to be a huge drain on your time in terms of getting it up and ready. That's good. No, not a short, uh, no. In fact, um, at the end of April, I was um, part of the East Hamptons demonstration of the voting equipment, which is the same voting equipment we'll get. Um, so I got to watch all morning long how it works with the software, with the hardware. I got to put ballots to the machine. So I, I've got a hands-on, you know, knowledge of it now. Yeah, and the new tabulators aren't that much different than our old tabulators. It's the software that's the biggest change. So I, I also just wanted, you know, we've been doing thank you notes for people as they come. The, um, I had to do a vital record for my mom and then I had to do, redo my dog license. And <laughs> you, your, your team is great because um, 
little things like I'm supposed to send in a stamped envelope so you can mail me back the dog license. Um, someone knows that I forgot to put the envelope in mm -hmm. and it's sitting on their desk. It's just, it, the level of personal service is pretty extraordinary. So thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. We try. So um, on rank choice voting, uh, we have the equipment that are, are we going ahead with buying the equipment even if we did, um, though it appears we're not going to be able to do ranked choice voting for our next round of municipal election. Um, is there um, any other changes that come with the new equipment or will it read ballots that are in the format that we that everyone's used to? It's able to read the old ballots. It's going to read the new ballots as well. Um, also, um, I believe it's in the capital budget, so it is on, you know, in line for proceeding. But um, from the time that I got the quote on the equipment and the availability to putting together my responses here for the budget first meeting at JCPC, um, we well, actually, probably after that, we found out that there's a waiting list on this equipment now. So as you know, with COVID and parts from China, these um, tabulators are assembled in the US, but with parts from China. So the um, vendor is having a hard time getting the parts. Um, so he's got a waiting list. They had a whole bunch of equipment, they sold them all out and now there's a waiting list. So even if, you know, we're, we're um, I don't know what the timeline is at this point with COVID lightning and things coming back to normal, maybe that won't be a problem when we're ready to purchase them. But um, as of actually, I found this out at the end of April when I was at, I'm remembering now, I was at the um, demonstration in East Hampton. That's when he told me. So end of April, yeah. I think we had gotten the quote in February though. Yeah. And then my other election question is, is that we went through quite a back and forth uh, last year uh, about location and numbers of voting places. And uh, in addition to that, we did a lot with mail-in voting that we didn't do, which reduced the number of people who needed to vote at voting at, at precincts. Um, and uh, I also recognize that we had challenges with uh, COVID in just fun, making sure that we had enough people who could work as mm -hmm. election workers. And putting all of those things together, uh, do you have any recommendations for the council as things that we should reconsider on these issues of the uh, number and location of voting um, sites? Um, well, I can tell you precinct two, the North Fire Station really does not want us there. It's a fire station. It's always been an issue. And we always have pushback with the schools. Um, we just, I think this is an ongoing area that we need to come to some kind of resolution on. Um, the early, the voting by mail is going to be over and done with at the end of June. So we're gonna go back to normal times on how people can get their ballots. So it's back to just absentee or in person for town elections. So I think that's gonna bring the numbers back out into the precincts. From what I heard, I, you, you all must have, you know, you may have heard more than me, but I didn't get any complaints at all on the high school on election day, we had none. People were just, you know, the usual phone calls, like, where do I go to vote again? We'd tell them and then, you know, um, so the high school is definitely a, a viable option for permanency. Number of polling places in there is, I don't know, we'd have to, you know, I think one of the issues with that location is electrical plugs. Where do you plug in the tabulators? Um, but there are quite a few precincts, precinct one, no parking. We, we've always had this issue. Um, I really don't know what the solutions are. You know, there's always pushback with voters because they like their little neighborhood precincts, but it comes to a point where, you know, um, if the location doesn't want you there, then you do have to find some other location. I hope that answers your question. I'm yeah, not, no, yeah. It's helpful. I mean, it's, okay. it's an ongoing conversation and yeah. it seems like we need to be thinking about it in the process to, that works with you to try and address it 
proactively and not wait until the end. Yeah. Lynn, do you have some thoughts on it or other subject? I, can I jump in there, Andy? Yeah. So uh, the, the two previous town clerks, Margaret and Shavina, both had the idea of a centralized polling location, which many communities do. Um, and that's uh, where the, the proposal for the consolidated location at the high school came into play. And that was, you know, I think you got a lot of negative feedback on that and made a decision like we can do that for some, but not all, because people, there are different values in play and you don't want to disenfranchise folks. Um, and that was the sense of that. So I think that that's um, one solution, but otherwise we're going to be fine trying to find locations and there aren't many available other than schools and there aren't many public buildings available right now. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me that uh, it's going to cause us not to uh, necessarily go back to the further discussion of just one location, but on the other hand, uh, whether we can maintain the number of locations and have to be creative about uh, thinking of new locations, new options, like what, what do we do with the um, fact that the fire station doesn't really want us? Is there another uh, option that's available to us? Um, I know that in the past, um, we asked permission from Emanuel Lutheran Church to put two polling places in there and they were agreeable. So if precinct two had to be moved, it could move over to precinct three. It's not that far away. That's one solution for one little problem. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if the university would be willing to allow us to use space in any building that has parking, like its own police facility, for example. Yeah. The community room they have there. Uh, so, Lynn, did you have other things that you wanted to raise? I just want to say that I actually made it a point to go visit polling sites on election day, and I saw no problems at all at the high school. However, I, I just don't want to go through what we went through last August. Uh, if it weren't for Kathy uh, working side by side with me to rewrite an entire plan for polls, uh, we would have been up a creek. Um, and I, one of the things, uh, just to lay out a sense of calendar, we don't have a primary this year. There is only a general election and it will most likely not be ranked choice voting. And then the next year is the state election. And by then we will have gone through redistricting, which means there may be some changes to polling places anyway. So that is a roundabout way of saying, Sue has her plate full to make sure we get through. Because then in 2023, we implement ranked choice voting. So the next three years um, are really very different election plans, if you will, for Amherst. And if we have to change uh, voting locations because of redistricting um, and re-precincting, uh, then there's a lot of education that has to come our way for that too. So yep. thank you, Sue, for everything you're up to. <laughs> yes, and <I'm> some. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for the clarification. And Dorothy? You... Yeah, real quick. Voting by mail as we had it, we don't control it. It's state controlled. Correct. Fine. That answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Uh... What did you do with marriage intentions? If uh, oh, I feel bad about that, we you know it's get married. You know there are a couple of hand a couple of towns locally that are taking appointments. Um, I know Belchertown is, but they're only doing it for their residents. There's all these conditions, so we're just telling people start calling around, seeing who will take your intent your intentions. But it takes about fifteen to twenty minutes, depending on the couple, to fill out the paperwork. Well, they could just live in sin. That wouldn't be. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, I've had, you know, I, I've had personal people asking if I would marry them and okay, and then can we, can we file our intentions with you? I'm like, yes, no. 
you know, I feel bad. Um, but yeah, it, I'm, I'm, you know, with the opening up and we'll figure out how to do it. You know, it was always just tough here because what do you do? Stop what you're doing for half an hour, maybe go downstairs and just sit and wait while people, because the forms can't leave the building. There are all these requirements around it. They can't take them home and then bring them back. So it, it just was what it was. And luckily we're at the other end here now. And Pat, I have to tell you, I've been working since I was 13. My first job was cutting onions in a snack bar to make onion rings. Oh, I love it. Worst <laughs> job ever. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> we'll get together for coffee when COVID yeah. <laughs> my worst one. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> so anything else, uh, looking for the committee list, see if anybody else has any other questions that they were in the end. I know it's uh, been a, challenging year in many in probably every respect for you and I really appreciate it. And on behalf of the entire council and I say how glad we were to have you um, come on board as our clerk and um, I think that uh, the way you've managed us through these crises has proven that that's right so thank oh, you thank you very All much you. thank you and Amber too Amber deserves just as much praise she's like my second in command. Yes, a really strong second in command. And uh, um, since she's not on the call, please convey our appreciation to her also. I will, absolutely. Okay. okay. Thank, you. thank you. And Jeremiah's here and he can tell us all about anything that he's observed about polling locations since uh, did a lot of work on getting us there. Question we had asked was, uh, Jeremiah was, uh, I think he might have not come on board yet, but uh, whether there were any observations about where we ended up with in the um, voting locations and uh, whether there anything that we learned from that that we would want to uh, consider as we're going forward. Well, yeah, I, and I should have, I should have mentioned the entire Man, the maintenance staff, they were phenomenal in all of this and, um, and DPW, but um, he pulled together so many things and set things up. It was amazing. And I think, um, well, the biggest glitch that we found with the high school was, you know, we all went in there and checked out the space. It's plenty big, but then it was like, okay, where are the plugs? And they were way up in the ceiling, like 30 feet up. And so, oh, okay, we, we can't exactly reach that to plug in tabulators. There were only a few around the edges. So that was, that was a hurdle to overcome. But um, I think the biggest thing was the porta potties. That's learning going forward, no porta potties. <laughs> Nobody liked the porta potties. <laughs> we had so oh. many complaints from our workers. <laughs> but you know, the thing is, like, there he is. Um, they couldn't use the bathrooms in the, in the facilities. So it was the only other solution. I'll leave yeah. it over to you, Jeremiah. Yeah, I did. I did hear a little bit of that. And, and I, I would have to say, you know, it was it was most certainly a challenging uh, election uh, navigating um, all the safety protocols um, uh, due to the, the pandemic. Um, it, on the back side of that, I, I really do see a, a benefit of having that central location. Um, with each of the facilities that we do have for the polling locations, some of them, I believe, lend themselves well. And then there are others that are, are quite challenging. Um, and, and I think that if we could somehow uh, um, utilize uh, that, that single location and everyone is comfortable doing so, I, I think that would be a great benefit. Um, there is... Some of the facilities uh, I almost have zero um, vehicle traffic. It's, it's extremely hard or, or extremely difficult uh, to place vehicles. Uh, so driving up, it, they work well for foot traffic, but driving up, it, it, just, does, it just doesn't work. Um, and then there are others areas that have great, great parking and, and that have, are very expansive, but then those facilities are a little bit more remote for the foot traffic. Um, so if we could bring all of those together, I see the high school as being a benefit. It has sort of both. It has, you know, the public transportation, you know, it's, it's fairly centrally located and we do have a lot of parking. Um, 
I, perhaps I think, I just think that maybe the conversation should continue with that. I, I see, I see benefits to it. It's, it was, it was challenging with the elections, but it was also a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. I'm glad you had some fun with it. Uh, <laughs> Sue, actually, is, uh, uh, can we um, have a system where people can, now that we're not using just paper books, but we're in the age of technology, can people choose a location to go to or does state law still require that people vote in person only at the precinct that they are registered at? Yeah, no, only at the precinct they're registered at. Yeah. So that would That's... require um, state law change to to uh, take advantage of technology and look and solve some of the problem that way. Yeah, no, there's still very old fashioned laws on the books. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if uh, any advocacy with the legislature, uh, I'm afraid the secretary, Secretary of the Commonwealth may be less flexible in the legislature on this one. Well, I do know that Galvin is trying for um, early voting to be a permanent thing. So if that, you know, not early voting, I'm sorry, mail-in voting, mail-in ballots. So if that were to pass and it became permanent for all elections, that, you know, right there helps out a lot for people who can't get to their polling places or, or what have you. Um, we'll see what happens. He's fighting, but hasn't passed yet yeah um but that requirement that you have to vote at the specific precinct does limit options and is another way of limiting voter options well mind. right if you want to vote in person right you still have to stay with your precinct but if you have the option of not having to go out to your precinct you could vote by mail yeah and the early voting gave us a second location for everybody any other questions, uh, Pat, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I stepped away for a moment to get some water, uh, so I might have missed this, but when we talk about having one polling place, what um, that impacts people without transportation, without uh, personal transportation, very directly. And so how would you be addressing that? I know the bus route is only, it's a quarter of a mile away. I think that was already looked at. Um, um, we had talked about trolleys, you know, um, that would be something we could further discuss though, if there are any kind of van pools that could be put in place, that sort of thing, even, a, even school buses. Yeah, 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 because it seems to me that if there's only one polling place, it impacts people very differently, which is a kind of, uh, uh, it, it can be a real block to voting. So uh, it would have to be considered and, and have to be implemented, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, currently the polling locations are not within walking distance of a large part of the population. If you happen to live near your, where your polling place is, you're lucky, but uh, most people are some distance. I think right now people, depending on where you live and what is, you know, if you live like Applewood, I know Applewood has vans, that sort of thing for their population. I know most people just rely on their own cars, but if you don't have that, call a friend. If you don't have that, I know this is always an issue everywhere, not just here. Right, and it would, but it would directly impact people uh, uh, with, uh, low-income people who are reliant on public transportation from areas uh, like the Boulders and South Point and stuff like that. So if we're going to do that, we have to provide something to make the voting fair. Um, you know, it can take several hours to do something by our public transportation system. Um, and there's, you know, so it's just something to seriously consider. Okay, let me uh, go on. Uh, Bernie? Yeah, I, I think the hopefully the, the advocacy around mail-in voting and early voting will continue and we'll, we'll get somewhere with that because going to a single um, polling place, which we did in Belchertown, um, Sue will appreciate the design of the middle school in Belchertown because it was designed deliberately to use the gymnasium as a polling place so you can close off everything around it. 
Um, and I guess there are enough plugs. But, um, uh, you, you know, we're, we're, we're going to inconvenience people if we, no matter what we do in terms of, of, of how we vote. So we really need to find something that's optimal for people. And, and I, I, you know, I, I would encourage all of us to um, talk to our, our reps and senators about making voting easier. Making better public transportation. <laughs> well, yeah, well, we're so, don't, don't get me started on the public transportation. I mean, I, um, I, I, live a, I live a half a mile away from a bus stop that I can't depend on. Right. So, um, you know, because the transportation is tied into the university and, um, and the right. five colleges. So, exactly. Anyway. But, um, you know, if we do go to a single point of, uh, uh, to a single polling place, uh, I think it'd be incumbent on us to, to try to find some way of getting people there who want to vote in person. And hopefully the um, mail-in voting will make life easier for all of us. Dorothy? I want to just clarify the way the voting is done. Um, I haven't paid attention lately, but when I used to go in, the reason that you have to go to your polling place is that there's a book and the book is for the people, for the blocks that are in that place. And in the book, there would be uh, cards or that had your name and address on it. Or do you use that or do you use printed lists? So it's, it's a printed list from the voter registration system. It's the voter list. We print them out by precinct. They right. go into a binder. It's, um, it's um, by street name and then alpha within the, well, by number and then alpha. So, you know, you'd, you'd approach the check-in table. You'd say, I live on Allen Street, number 24, and my name is. And then, boom, Allen, 24, there you are, check, um, if you're active. So, yeah, it's, a, it's, the, it's the voter list is what we print. So that could, in fact, be at all the polling places if, if you needed it. Wait, they um, have to be. It is already. Okay, but one reason you, I would think you might need to vote at your own dedicated polling place is it is partly a um, making sure that somebody doesn't vote twice, you know, hitting all the polling places, mm -hmm. uh, which theoretically could be caught, um, or if everything is electronic, but I have to say I really don't, I'm not in favor of everything being electronic because people are having, they're losing confidence that that's safe. Um, so but you, you do the printed out voting shit. So okay, that, that, should, that should work. So then the last thing is a suggestion on the new school that will be built, perhaps what Bernie mentioned, um, that when they do the gymnasium, they do think of it as a possible polling place and include the plugs, the whatever that would be required um, and, the, and the bathroom and the ability to shut it off from the rest of the school so you're not compromising st uh, student security. Okay. No, that's a good suggestion. We'll pass it along to the chair of the uh, school building committee. Um, so, Jeremiah, uh, if there's nothing else on elections, then I really do want to um, thank Sue and make it official that we're not going to talk about elections and guys' facilities and move on. Okay. So thank you. <laughs> All right, thank uh, you all. So turning on to facilities maintenance, uh, you, any introductory piece that you wanna give first? Sure, uh, I'll just do a, a brief overview. Uh, first off, my name is Jeremiah LaPlante. I'm the facilities and maintenance manager for the town. Uh, I supervise uh, and, and coordinate all of the maintenance and custodial work uh, for uh, many of the, the town buildings. Uh, those buildings include the town hall, uh, police department, uh, Banks Community Center, uh, Bolt, Boltwood Walk, uh, parking garage, East Street School, um, South Amherst Campus, Amherst Child Care, uh, North Amherst Campus, and Munson uh, Memorial Library. Um, but my, uh, I would say my assistance uh, also goes beyond those buildings. Um, I often uh, communicate and collaborate with uh, the libraries and uh, with the schools as well, as we saw in the elections. <laughs> um, so I coordinate uh, prevent, preventive, predictive, and uh, corrective actions for all of these uh, various sites. 
uh, just ensuring that we the the buildings are uh, uh, looked at, uh, they are cleaned, um, they're in in good repair, uh, and then the grounds are obviously taken care of as well um, for all weather conditions. Um, I maintain uh, records of the equipment, the building, and the assets, um, and use those for short-term and long-term uh, improvements. Um, some of the work that I've done, or a lot of the work that I've done over the past year has been uh, uh, COVID-related, um, uh, as that has, uh, has really uh, uh, impacted uh, much of our, our lives. Um, one of those areas was the elections um, that we, we were just discussing, uh, and others were, was just general safety, uh, ensuring that all of our um, town's municipal employees, as well as the public, are safe in each, each one of those, those buildings. Uh, so just working, collaborating uh, with the individuals who work in each of those locations, uh, setting up sanitation stations, um, various barriers, uh, just all of those protocols, just make sure that we are following the guidance and keeping everyone safe. Oh, let me see if there are any questions, if comments from the committee. Start with uh, Kathy. Unmute. Um, on the buildings, um, I had I had a question about I think when you're talking about the North Amherst campus, that's the old school up here across from the library. Uh, South Amherst campus, correct? Yes. No, but what about North Amherst? What uh, what is North North Amherst School? Yes, across from the North Amherst Library. Yes. Okay, so my question about that is, um, and this is probably of the two of you with Paul. We rent for a while. We were renting out that whole top floor. There was Head Start, and then UMass had a piece of it that they were supporting. But my understanding is, it, at least the UMass piece was through a, a parent granting community service thing where they had the space. So with that part closed down, are you actually in and out of that building? How are we using that building right now? Um, do you do maintenance there? Do do how does it work with? A tenant, and I know down we've got Head Start, then downstairs we've got WIC. So just some, and then my other question um, is uh, with the hopefully fairly soon expansion of the North Amherst Library, which is a town building, and with a community space, will your team be part of taking care of that building, that North Amherst library, you know, at least struck the structural sides of it. So those two pieces, I mean, I understand the town, other town buildings. So I just want to know those two. Sure. So North Amherst uh, school right now is being used by the Head Start and Reach program. That's a portion of the, the top level. Um, Community Action, WIC, is using uh, the office space in, in the, at the ground level. Uh, and then the remaining area of the ground level is used by the town uh, for document storage. Um, as you said, the UMass uh, tenant, I, I believe is, is heading out and Paul might be able to answer this better, but in my interactions with uh, individuals from Head Start, it sounded as, as if they were looking to grow their area and, and take up that whole uh, uh, first floor. Through this pandemic, it has been in large, empty, vacated. Um, I, I make it a point to go through every one of the buildings uh, weekly, if not more. Uh, for one, I know that there are children that would typically be in that building. So it's important to me uh, to ma make sure that the water systems are up to par. So I do weekly flushing of the, all the water systems uh, throughout the building because I really don't know when they'll be back. So I, I really wanna, wanna be sure that the water is safe. There's no stagnation 
That also helps me. I, I'm able to put eyes on all of the equipment, the major equipment in there, the HVAC electrical, really just to keep an eye on the building. Uh, Cause I, I'm sort of the steward of <laughs> these places. So I, I want to put eyes on it and I will go from the basement right to the attic uh, and, and have a look. Um, so I, at least minimum weekly, sometimes more often. And then the North Amherst Library, I know some of what the work that's being done is repair of the building as well as the renovation. So, and part of, you, you had a request from roof, but is that also under your you or is that just one that sort of sits out there as an orphan? It's, <laughs> not, it, it, it's, it's not, I mean, the Joan, Jones Library says, you know, the building is the town, you know, the-, the Right. The, the staff is the library, but I'm just, it wasn't listed under the buildings we, and Munson was, so it's my right. question. I, I, for this one, I, I would think that maybe the, I, I should look for a little bit more clarification. I know that it is a town building, uh, but at, at this point, I believe uh, the Jones staff um, assists with that building, uh, but you are correct. It is a, it's a town building in the Jones Library essentially occupies that building, uh, but they've also been supporting that building with cleaning and maintenance. Okay. So to the extent there was a maintenance need, um, in the past at least, they would have come, if it was a, a, at a capital level, they would have been the group that would bring the capital request. I mean, there haven't, the, the more recent one, there's a series of repairs going on. So I'm, I'm just, you know, I love it that you're doing all these buildings, you know, and, you know, and in paying and just so people know on JCPC, one of the things Jeremiah was talking about with a capital fund that he has is worrying about the exterior of all the buildings so that water's not getting through. So it's not just, you know, boilers and chillers. I think it's fabulous that we have someone that is uh, thinking inside, outside, um, and as you just said, even water systems, it, it's fantastic. Yeah. I just, so that was why I was wondering if this one, I, I orphan's not quite the right word, but it's any, <laughs> you know, it's going to, when it's rebuilt and expanded, it will have a bathroom. Um, it will have a community room. Um, and yeah, so, okay. That, that you answered my question. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there is a uh, issue that for somebody's going to have to deal with, but I think it's really not in the council's uh, role necessarily to be the ones. The community room needs to be managed. When it's not being used by library functions, the question will be, how does it get utilized and managed? And uh, Paul? Yeah, so the library director and I have had those conversations. The, the, the library won't be scheduling the community room. They'll be present, obviously. But we manage the Munson Library, the Munson Memorial Building now, and we probably do the, we're looking at doing the same thing. Plus, we're looking at doing as much electronic sort of access control as we can in the new addition so that uh, it doesn't have to, you don't have to have a key to get in and things like that. So as much as we can do it um, at, with 21st century technology, but there will, it will be an expanded responsibility for the facilities department. Thank Lynn? you. Lynn, do you have something? Your hand is up. Yeah. So the answer is, so are there um, other questions? Um, I yeah, go ahead. I have one. I mean, I know we're supposed to only be focusing on FY22, but um, Jeremiah's skills in terms of looking at all these buildings, I'm assuming you're not always also over in our school buildings, but I, I think you were starting to look at the extra uh, on the capital side for, for fire. If and when we hopefully are building a new school and one of them becomes vacant, would Jeremiah be part of the team that was thinking of potential reuses or alternative uses, you know, including when we're saying, you know, what could the space be used for and 
pull, you know, if there's staff expansions, there are functions that right now we don't even have the space for that we, we might want. Um, because that that kind of assessment would be look at it not as an elementary school, but looking at it is okay, now it's a building. <laughs> um, and oh, the open classroom might not be a problem if you're using it for something else. So that's my sort of who's part of a team that's starting to think of a, it as a capital resource and what what its short-term and long-term maintenance needs or renovation needs might be? Right, so, so that was a very good question. So when, if, if, if we have an excess building, um, we have a property committee, a review, a committee that can review that, but a, a major property like a elementary school is a pretty big conversation to have at the, at the town council level and but you'd want a reuse committee or somebody who's looking at it. what what do you want to use do you want to sell it do you want to use it for something else um, and I think on if you're going to use it for something else the facilities manager is key because they're the ones who are going to be maintaining it and they have the inside scoop uh, that's why we have Rupert on the elementary school building committee when they st you start designing something you want to know from the people who are doing the work what's it going to take to maintain so yes, Jeremiah and Jeremiah brings such a broad set of skills. We're just really fortunate to have him. So we keep piling more things on him, whether he likes it or not. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's what Paul. You did see me trying to start to grab Jeremiah there as we as we're not not waiting to think about it four years from now, but thinking about it over the next several years. Um, yeah. Thank you. And I guess the other question that I would have only because I'm sort of anticipating what areas of interest other members of the council would have at some point, we're going to have an energy um, plan. And uh, when the energy plan is in place, um, it's probably going to uh, want us to move in certain directions and uh, what steps we can sort of anticipate coming up in the structure administratively to get us there and financially to get us there. Yeah, so I, I don't think we want Jeremiah to get into the, the nitty gritty detail he did with JCPC about BTUs and everything like that. But one oh. of the reasons in the budget was to create a fund that was available so that he could be opportunistic about uh, and with working with Stephanie Ciccarello about getting outside funding to do energy efficient things. Do you want to give an example or two of that, Jeremiah? Do you have something like that? Yeah, yeah. and we, we, could, we could say that just looking at Munson and the, the recent conversations we've had with replacing the HVAC system over there, um, I, I would say that I use, I use that uh, as, as my guide uh, when I'm approaching some of these different projects that to, to think about the energy conservation and sustainability. Um, and now with, with that wonderful ADA uh, report that we have, just bo using both of those as a guide um, when, when thinking about any of these projects. Um, so I, I've, it, it's gone as far as um, I, looking at replacing some of the flooring at, at Munson and reaching out to, to uh, St Stephanie and saying, you, you know, from a sustainability um, perspective, you know, what, what, what could I do? You know, I just want to ensure that that I'm always pushing uh, to to reach those goals because they are they are achievable, but they are also lofty. So I think it's important to to have that written in front of me at all times um, while assessing the buildings. Um, as far as getting solar on roofs of buildings or parking lots, we're looking for some opportunities and. You, and one one example of that would would be uh, the Amherst Police Department. Uh, so um, working with Sean about different capital projects, you know, kind of shifting some things around. Um, I, I I needed to move the chiller uh, up front a little bit more than the roof, but when we get to that roof, absolutely, I, I would love to see solar on that roof, and that's going to help offset. Uh, some of the increases that we have in our in our energy our, our electrical um, expenses, but there are other opportunities, and I think that the town has is looking into some bigger um, energy opportunities. So, 
Bangs is a good roof. Bangs is nice and flat. Uh, the buildings surrounding Bangs also have, have solar. So it, these are things that we definitely need to look at in the future. So looking to the committee, anybody else have questions? Other no. than saying we're glad to have you, Jeremiah. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I don't want to hold you any longer. If there's nobody else who wants to, there's a question they want to pose. I thought your budget, I really appreciated how was, uh, the information was provided. It's very helpful. And I know you've worked with uh, Sean to make sure that the information is available. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Very, very thorough and helpful. So anything else? If not, um, then uh, appreciate you having been with us and you're welcome to stay, but Thank I you. understand you have other things to get to. I'm going asparagus picking, so. Oh. <laughs> uh, we'll thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Okay, Jane. So um, I think that where we are at as a committee is uh, we have. Uh, getting near the end of the process. I just want to remind everybody to uh, keep uh, up. I'm trying to keep up with sections and the part that I've been assigned to and it's been hard. So I appreciate that it's been hard on the rest of you, but if we want to try and get reports to the uh, council as they are available to us to do that, okay. uh, it'll, it'll make our final process so much easier because we won't have to go into detailed reports about departmental discussions. Um, and uh, Lynn, you have your hand up, so let's see what you yeah, have. So I just want to make sure that, so I wrote up my report on the elementary schools. Is that all you need from me? I think so, because what we're going to do in the end is that we're going to vote on whether we have recommendations uh, to, uh, you know, support the budget as proposed or whether we have uh, recommendations to the council to take other action. And uh, what I'm looking for is to make sure that when we get to that stage, which is going to be under a very tight timeline that we don't have to go back and write up descriptions of departmental presentations. So I think the answer is yes, because uh, if, the, uh, if there's anything that comes out of the discussion in the last section that I described, the, what gets written up there is gonna flow from that meeting and that conversation. So I think that if uh, everybody. Uh, Andy, I, just a little bit more on the report because I'm feeling that um, I had fire and it was pretty straightforward. Uh, should I talk about some of the challenges they put forward in terms of maintenance and things like that, that are in the, re in the budget or, uh, so I'm a, a little uh, unsure of what I should be focusing on. Um, I can talk to you separately if that's helpful. Yeah, no, no, it's a fair question to ask. And I think it's probably worth talking about as a group. Um, by the way, there's been no public attendees most of the day. So that's why I haven't done anything about public comment. Um, I think the, what, why I um, really pushed to get the first one out and did several departments and community services and Lynn did one of did the elementary schools one, and it was in the first uh, report that was sent to the council. And uh, it gave her sort of a range because I think that Lynn dug a little deeper and did a little bit of um, her own research, I think when it was in enrollment trends, if I recall. Yeah, I, I just added the enrollment trends and uh, Kathy directed me to the uh, pages. and. What I did in, in mind was focus on the discussion 
that okay. was more not not the presentation gotcha. but the discussion so it was really the questions and uh, yeah, gotcha. it, to the extent that um, there were written questions and responses to written questions as there was uh, extensively and for several of the different departments uh, to PW. I think that that document in and of itself could form the basis of the report. What we Excellent. want to do is though make sure that it's in a format that uh, is easy to consume by whoever, whether it be a counselor or the public, because this is our opportunity finance committee that um, said what we heard regarding each of the departments. Uh, but I don't think that uh, we need to repeat what was in right. a very comprehensive document. I think the, a lot of the work was, was done. So I, um, when I did sections like um, the senior center, I certainly went back and looked at the budget book, but tried to think about the topics that came up during right. the conversation. Right. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Andy, I just, I thought, I just saw, I thought I saw Rob Moore come and go. Were we going to be talking to him today, or was that just him coming into the wrong meeting? There was a Rob Moore that came on and off. Yes. Yeah. So he, he supervises uh, Jeremiah, so he was there for oh, support. Okay. okay, thanks. All right. Yeah, there was no side budget section specific. Okay, fine. I just didn't know we had whether we had someone in the room. Uh, <laughs> and we have a biggie coming up when we do planning conservation development, because that's he will be back. Then. So are you are you going to hold the next version? So. Well, what's my deadline? Because I have not written up police. Um, yeah, would you a deadline? You, I have. <laughs> so, so Pat and I have fire. I have police. She has fire. I have police. Uh, Bob's got uh, the biggie. So, when would you like those paragraph to two paragraphs, whatever we're planning on writing up? Is question number one and question number two? We did the Q and A's, and Sean has posted them. Are you plan? Are you thinking of? attaching them to the write-up so that to the extent people don't go and look, you know, so some of the original questions were answered in what Sean collected, and then we don't have to write those. They were, that was part of the conversation. So I have that two-part um, question. Let me ask your opinion collectively about that because there's two ways to handle that. Uh, one is to attach it to the physical document, and the other is just to put links into the physical document to get people there. Is your preference? Link? I like links. I vote for links. Yeah. They yeah, just put, spent an put, enormous put amount of time creating a budget document with links in it. Let's utilize it. So what you would want to do is, uh, if there's something that you think is important, or you could just say that a number of questions were asked and uh, information is provided to the committee and it's available at this one, and then do it as a link. You're, you're looking for a fairly brief report from us. Yeah, I think that brief, and that's why I say, um, if you don't have that, uh, uh, one, I'm trying to remember which date it was, where we had schools and two of the community services departments, recreation and uh, senior services. It kind of gives you a model. I did it early so that you'd have at least some context to place it in. Okay. Uh, and uh, Dorothy has done one in the library, but I was waiting to have a grouping to put it in. Um, and as far as the date is concerned, it's too late for next Monday. We're not going to get a finance committee report that's going to have uh, a comprehensive section with a number of things. So it's probably um, middle of next week. 
Okay. And we really uh, are early next week. Is early in next week as you can possibly do it. And uh, that would give us time to get it in. And if we have to do an additional report to the council that is sent by email and then put into the packet of the next meeting for the public, that's um, another option. So we, if we have to do multiple reports, we will, but let's just try and get it moving. And I appreciate it. So I think that the other thing, the only other thing that I'll just mention real quickly so we can be done is um, on schedule. Um, we know we have two meetings on the 27th, just uh, to be aware that there are those two meetings and I'll try and uh, get through the first one as quickly as we can so that there's some reasonable time in between because the community service working group will be with us later. I think that the complexity that we have is that if we also need to come back to a discussion, which we do about um, uh, how to permanently fund reparations, we may have to add that to the first meeting on the 27th. Mm. And uh, that will um, put a little bit more stress on the situation. So yes. I have one suggestion and not um, for, the, for Bob, Bernie, Jane, to the extent you want to spend a little extra time on what we're going to see on the 27th, that discussion, that will be presented to the council Monday night. Am I correct, Lynn? You know, so you would at least get a flavor, not so Paul sent you, you got the document, but you'd hear the initial questions people have. And because they've, they've, um, in addition to a reporting on what they've done, they've provided a potential, this is what the whole uh, new staffing could look like and the price, uh, price tag on it. So if you wanted to hear them talk about it, that's Monday night, so. We can also provide you the link, but my estimation, which is, as always, quite optimistic <laughs> that uh, it would be at around 7.30. <laughs> Stop laughing. Always, always a guess. Okay, anything else? I have no anticipated business. Uh, let me just check to see. We do have one attendee now. Uh, that's Jane, she's joined by phone. Okay. So, um, it, uh, so we have no, so we have no uh, public comment, and uh, nobody's come up with any additional unanticipated business. So I will uh, then treat us as adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye.